Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the regular council meeting for October 3rd, 2016. I want to first recognize that we're on the traditional territory of the Sunimo First Nations. And I want to introduce tonight Ms. Jane Armstrong, our new city clerk, uh, seated next to Councillor Hong. So, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Introduction of late items, please. Uh, when we get there. Oh, pardon me. It, the, I'd also like to introduce our chief operating officer. He wasn't seated when I uh, uh, earlier, uh, Mr. Brad McRae. So, uh, introduction of late items, please. We will be amending tonight's agenda as follows. Under the administration reports, item 7A, status of reports requested by council, we'll be adding an attachment. Item 7C, a property maintenance bylaw 1990. Uh, we will be removing um, 861 East Wellington Road and 224 View Street. We will be adding item 7D, property maintenance for industrial properties. Under community services reports, we will add item 9A, lower colliery dam, auxiliary spillway final costs. And we're going to be adding a delegation, Mr. Robert Fuller. Under uh, item 9D, development permit number 1007, we are going to be adding a delegation, train developments on behalf of CMTC Architect. Item 9K, unauthorized suites, we will be deleting 3463 Blackfoot Way. We are going to add item 9M, Opportunities Assessment of City-Owned Greater Nanaimo Water District Properties. Under bylaws, we will add item 10B, Zoning Amendment Bylaw 2015, number 4500.078. And under Core Service Reports and Delegation, we will add item 15A, Core Services Report Implementation Plan. Thank you. And are there any other late items for Council? Council Kip. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I have a request for a delegation from Mr. Terry Wagger for Community Services 9A, the Colry Dam, and for Community Services 9M, the Opportunities Assessment for the GNWD lands. So that's Mr. Terry Wagger for 9A and 9M. Thank you. Any other items, Council? Seeing none, can I have a motion to adopt the agenda as amended? Seconded. Moved by Councillor Bestrick. Seconded. Seconded. By yes. Councillor Kipp. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, call the question. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Now, I just wanted to make, uh, just wanted to make this note uh, to the gallery and to the public that uh, Council recessed the in-camera session uh, due to Council's schedule tomorrow and the uh, inability for all members to attend, the in-camera session was recessed and we'll be going back to it at 10.30 p.m. So what we will be doing is we will be requesting our clerk staff to go through any of the emergent bylaws that require uh, adoption or moving tonight and that that and question period be completed before 10.30. So we'll be looking forward to uh, you to advise us on which items need, need to be included. So we will be, uh, we will be uh, terminating this meeting at 10.30. So next item, uh, adoption of minutes, none. Oh, uh, presentations, number five. Mr. Sean DePaul, the Regional District of Nanaimo to present the bylaw 1547.01 regarding the Southern Community Sewer Service Area. Good evening, sir. Thank you. Can you hear me? Certainly. Yep. Okay, thanks. Uh, my name is Sean DePole. I'm the manager of Wastewater Services. I have uh, acting CAO Wendy Adima with me and Randy Alexander, uh, GM uh, Regional Community Utilities. So, Today, uh, tonight I'm going to go through the uh, development cost charges, uh, provide information on the review we've recently done, 
and this will be just for information. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll cover a little bit of information on DCCs. I'll talk about the current review. I'll talk about the wastewater capital projects that relate to our DCC program. And uh, I'll then go into the new proposed DCC rates and then the schedule uh, moving ahead to have those DCC rates become reality. So... So uh, DCCs, uh, they're set, off, uh, set up to offset costs related to development. So whether it's residential, commercial, institutional, any of that type of development has an impact on our infrastructure and specifically uh, what I'm talking about here is our wastewater infrastructure that the regional district uh, operates and maintains. Um, the, uh, the reason here is that the development puts, a, puts a, a, a demand on that, but existing, payers, uh, existing taxpayers don't. So uh, when this comes down, the cost is to be allocated to that development. Uh, this is all governed under the Local Government Act, and it sets out requirements that need to be followed in terms of developing bylaws and rates. Uh, and one other thing within the, within the Local Government Act, it requires that the that we set uh, 1% assist factor as a minimum. It is, uh, sometimes projects will, will be looked at as a, an additional benefit to existing users. And uh, it has been seen that some, sometimes you will apply a higher assist factor. In this case, we'll be simply applying the minimum required 1% assist factor. So uh, in terms of the DCCs, the DCCs will be applied to pay for expa uh, capacity at the treatment plant. So almost all of our projects have a bit of an over overlap where some provide capacity, but other components are up upgrades or replacing HE infrastructure. So in the case of the Southern community, we're, we're looking at projects associated with secondary treatment, our pump stations, the interceptor, which is the main trunk line that runs along the foreshore and our outfall. Um, in, the, uh, in, in terms of collecting DCCs, uh, we establish the rate, but the municipalities collect the DCCs and they collect them as part of their own DCCs, typically at the time of subdivision. Um, there's one other thing that we've identified in our DCC and we follow the lead of the city where there's a 50% reduction for affordable housing. So if a project comes forward and they're able to meet certain criteria that identify as affordable housing, we provide a 50% reduction. So our DCCs were last updated in 2009. We've, in 2015, we've retained a, a consulting engineer <coughs> who's led the review. Uh, and they've looked at various things to come up with new rates. They've looked at development projections and updated those. They've looked at the capital project cost estimates and the schedule, and those have been updated. And with this information, we've then calculated new DCC rates. Uh, we completed that uh, early uh, summer, and then we did a review with the municipalities. In the case of the southern communities, we met with city and IMO staff and Lansville staff. Following the meeting, we made a few little tweaks, and uh, we have the, the bylaw and the rates where we feel as though they represent what they should go to. So now moving to the capital projects. Uh, there's three capital projects that we've identified. Um, the Greater Nile Pollution Control Center secondary <coughs> upgrade. Uh, it's, it is a secondary project, but there's many projects within that one. Um, this one is a $79 million project. 40% of the cost we are assigning to uh, new development. So that is 40% of the project will increase capacity. The remainder will be related to secondary treatment and replacement of age, aging infrastructure. And just, to, uh, just while I'm talking about secondary treatment, a quick update. We've issued a, uh, we've issued a request for qualifications in the summer. That's closed. Uh, we had 
11 submissions we selected. We've uh, shortened it down to seven, so we've selected seven. Uh, we're completing the final uh, design and tender documents, which we'll be issuing at the end of October and, uh, and having it close second week of January. The next project, which will be actually carried out as part of the secondary project, we were looking at actually doing this earlier, but the, the savings with uh, connecting it to a larger project warranted us holding off on it. Uh, this project is $1.4 million, and it's a 50-50 split. The photos here, you see this, uh, we had two belt filter presses that were originally in place. And actually, I should take a step back. The belt filter press and the centrifuge are for dewatering treated solids, which allows us to beneficially use our biosolids. Uh, and we beneficially use them at the DIU Woodlot uh, um, as a fertilization project. So the photos here are from 2009. Uh, one, of the center, uh, one of the belt filter presses was removed and replaced with the centrifuge on, on the left there. Um, we'll be essentially doing the same thing as well as we're, we're upgrading the chemical system associated with, with the centrifuge. Uh, one thing that I don't show on the slide as of uh, on Friday after I had submitted the slide to the City and Amos IT department, we had word that we've received $1 million, uh, $1 million grant based on an application that we made several months ago. So that will reduce the uh, $700,000 to $200,000. Next is the Departure Bay, or the last capital project as part of the DC DCC program, is the Departure Bay Force Main. We have it scheduled for 2026 to 2028. Total project cost is estimated at $23 million, and this will be a 50-50 split. It will be replacing aging infrastructure, but doubling the capacity of, of, the, uh, of the line. The photo that we, or sorry, the, the drawing here, it's an original uh, from 1972, original construction drawing, and a little bit hard to see, but uh, most of the routing follows Hammond Bay Road, so uh, there's quite a bit of complexity associated with this project. Um, and we will be looking at that routing and actually working with the City of Nanaimo as well to see if there is any, any benefit to move some of their capital projects for water replacement line, uh, lines and so on. The photo on the right is, is the high-density polyethylene pipe that was used for our outfall replacement, which we recently completed. Likely that will be the material that we'll use for the replacement here. The, the existing force main is made out of the same material as the outfall was. It's, high uh, it's a steel, epoxy coated steel pipe. Um, however, the environment here is not quite as harsh as that of the marine envi environment, but uh, we do have early indication that, uh, that this pipe is deteriorating. Uh, next is, this is, uh, this is the existing rate and the proposed rate. We do see a 30% increase. I had mentioned we received a million dollar grant for the centrifuge. It will reduce the overall cost by just about a percent, so it'll be closer to 29% increase. Um, and and these, these different rates for these different categories have been established uh, to be consistent with what the city is collecting on each one of these, uh, on each one of these development types. Uh, and, and what it's looked at is we look at actually person for each one of the categories. So single family dwelling, <coughs> we estimate the average is 2.3 and we've worked with the city of Nanaimo on those numbers and that establishes that rate where mobile home parks are, uh, are uh, significantly less than that. And then this is the final slide, the schedule. So start of the project, uh, we've updated as I said over the spring, finished early summer met with uh, City and Animal staff, we're here now. Next will be in November, we'll be taking a report forward to the RDM board for first and second reading. And then in the new year, we'll start our public consultation. And then uh, later that spring, we will look at uh, going to the board for third, third reading and adoption. And then we're looking at a six month window <coughs> to deal with any in-stream applications before the new rate takes effect. Thank you. Questions, Councillor Hong. Um, thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Sean, for coming forward to, to do your presentation. So when, when I'm looking at these numbers, when you talk about, well, we'll say the secondary treatment, it's a $79 million project, and 40% split, where $31 million was <coughs> DCC. Is that, are you saying that $31 million needs to be paid for by DCCs? That, that's correct, yeah. It, $31 million will be funded through the DCC program. The remainder will come out of uh, taxation. Typically, we'll have, I should state too that uh, as part of our DCC program, we collect DCCs, they go into reserves. Uh, however, we will deplete the reserves and we will be required to borrow as part of early on, the funds will actually go back to pay back the money that we borrowed under that program. Okay, and then if I can continue and follow up on that. Um, you're asking for a 30% increase in DCCs <coughs> on behalf of the RDN. We as the city of Nanaimo haven't even discussed what we need and how much we need to increase the DCCs for to justify the works that we need to do. We have water and we have all this other stuff and roads and everything and, and costs keep going up. But we haven't increased our DCC fees in how long? A number of years. So how come it's so easy for you to come forward to ask for a 30% increase in DCCs when we haven't even had a discussion on how much we can increase? So say we need 30%. We're at 60% increase in DCCs, roughly, if, if you can look at that. Is that kind of correct? Well, if you, if you increase 30% on your overall program, we increase 30%, it would, it would be 30% increase overall. So, One thing I, I could say about the 30% increase, it, it is over the last time we reviewed, so from 2009 to now, which is, which is, I didn't make the comparison, but it's actually less than what our tax requisition has been over that same period of time. Great, and I just wanted the people in Nanaimo to know that the city of Nanaimo hasn't looked at that DCC number, and that's just a number from RDN, so it, it might not be accurate. Thank you. Ms. Samra. Council will be seeing some work on the DCCs in the new year and work on our bylaws and recommendations for changing, so there are changes coming. So I wonder if, uh, if we can get an explanation for the benefit of the folks in the gallery and the, and the folks at home. When a new development is going in, do we have a, uh, can we put a finger on, uh, point to a number, a percentage, if there is a development going in the city of Nanaimo, uh, what the, the split between the DCCs for the city and the RDNR? I, I do actually believe I have a sheet here that has the city of Nanaimo's DCCs. Mr. Lindsay. Sorry. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Your Worship, I, I missed the question on the way in. Would you mind? Uh, for the benefit of the of the uh, of the people that are watching tonight and in the gallery, uh, can we get an idea of what the split currently is? But uh, on a new development, DCC contributions to the city and DCC contributions to the RDM. Oh, I. Um, so the the development cost charges collected in the city are are actually a collection on a number of separate bylaws. Uh, so there's transportation. There's parks, there's sewer distribution, there's water distribution and water supply. Um, uh, transportation, sorry, I said transportation, I should have said roads. Um, so the majority of the classes that we uh, collect for are uh, City of Nanaimo projects, but we do collect on behalf of the RDN for the sanitary sewer. So I don't have the exact number and it's gonna vary based on if you're talking about single family or if you're talking about uh, multifamily, but probably 80% 80, 80 of the DCCs we collect are for, are for city projects. Okay. Is there any information from what you've just been given? Or? I've just reconfirmed what I... Great, yes, thank you. Thank you very much.
Great. So for every thousand dollars, eight hundred is uh, city, and the other twenty is RDM. Thank you, Councilor Kip. Well, yeah, we collect five. We collect five different ones and two outside the water um, supply and sanitary RDN. And our total DCCs in a single family now are about sixteen thousand dollars. Multifamily and every uh, meter squared is ninety six dollars. Industrial meter squared eighty three dollars. Industrial per meter squared twenty one bucks. And the housing projects uh, per square for multifamilies are, uh, yeah, they're up there too, um, almost nine thousand bucks. And campgrounds are two thousand. So we collect the DCCs, and they, I think the last time they were affected was two thousand and nine, March. Thank you very much. I don't see any. Uh, I don't see any further questions. Thank you very much, sir. Can we have a motion to receive uh, for information the presentation? Moved by Councillor Kipp, seconded by Second. Councillor Besswick. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing Councillor Besswick. Okay. Any? No. Seeing no further discussion, call the question. All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next item uh, is Mayor's report. Uh, for the sake of brevity, I will hold that off until the next meeting. Uh, next one is administration, and that is uh, status of reports requested by council. And Ms. Sheila Gurry will be speaking to this report. Thank you, Your Worship. I'll be brief because we have a lot of business to get through. Um, I just wanted to provide a little description, a brief description of what this list is and um, what staff will be bringing forward to council for their information to one of the next two meetings in October. So. The current list that's on the addendum is a list of open requests for reports that Council has requested to staff since their term began in 2015. It shows reports that have been completed, I think the number's 35, um, that haven't been completed, 22, and four that are in progress. So in addition to this, staff have also been working on another list that outlines um, future reports that they see coming before Council that are either driven by the core services review, the strategic plan update, or other projects they have um, that have originated in their departments for best practices or other types of reports coming forward. So with the requests that council have made and the um, reports that staff see coming forward, we're going to be combining those two lists and reconciling them because there's some overlap. Staff have included some of the requests from council in this list and we'll be bringing it forward to you to show an agenda planning process and it's to help staff and council better plan the agendas going forward and for a better balance because right now out of necessity our agendas are heav heavily mostly full of regular council business that has to be dealt with um, at meetings. So going forward, we're hoping for a 12-month work plan. We can show the public, we can show council what staff intends to bring forward, um, prioritizing those requests from council and the other ones that need to come forward. That's it. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Gray? Seeing none. Motion to receive the report, please. Moved by Councillor Beswick, seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion? Seeing none, call the question all those in favor. Opposed, motion carries. Next one is B, appointment of bylaw enforcement officers. And the purpose is to obtain council approval to appoint Craig Dishkin and David Ellie as bylaw enforcement officers. And there's a recommendation on page nine that council appoint Craig Dishkin and David Ellie as bylaw enforcement officers to enforce the provision of the city of Nanaimo licensing and control of animals Bylaw 1995, number 4923, and Parks, Recreation, and Culture Regulation Bylaw 2008, number 7073. I move the recommendation. Moved by Councillor Thorpe. Seconded by? Second. Councillor Kip, thank you. So it's been moved and seconded. Questions, Councillor Kip? Um, I, I've noticed over time that we appoint bylaw enforcement officers. Do we ever unappoint them? Like when they're gone and they move on, do we unappoint them? Or is that a necessity? Uh, once they um, leave the employment of the city of Nanaimo, uh, they no longer carry the powers of, of a bylaw officer or an animal control officer. Oh, okay. Thank you. 
Thank you. I have one, uh, Mr. Davidson, um, and that is, I noticed that this report very specifically talked about uh, additional uh, oversight and enforcement of Parks, Rec, and Culture Regulation number 2078-7073. I thought when we were appointing bylaw officers who were under the employ of our animal control company, contractor, that they were enforcing all bylaws. They will enforce our animal control bylaw as well as uh, certain portions of the park bylaw, but that's all. They, they don't have the authority um, granted by council to, to do property maintenance or any other bylaw work, just those two. It's very specific to the contract we've signed. Th thank you very much for the clarification. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. I see no further questions. Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Next one is property maintenance bylaw number uh, 1990, number 3704. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six properties at this point. So it's requested that council hear anyone wishing to speak with respect to property maintenance for the properties listed below. And that includes 559 7th Street. Is there anyone wishing to speak to 559? I guess we have a numbering difference between the slide the slides in this. So 432, that's the last one. Okay, so let's just stick with it. 5597 five, Street. Is there anyone wishing to speak to 5597? Five, five, Next one, 611 7th. Is there anyone wishing to speak to 611 7th Street? 218 View Street. Anyone wishing to speak to 218 View Street? Sixteen fifty eight Sherwood Drive. Anyone wishing to speak to sixteen, please, sir, come on down. That's one six five eight Sherwood Drive. Good evening, sir. We'll need your name and address for the file. Uh, for the record. Hachi Ishikawa, sixteen fifty eight Shell Drive. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for allowing me to speak to you tonight. Uh, I'd like to explain to you from the beginning. And uh, this happened on September 14th. I received a registered mail from the city. Prior to that, I had no communication from the city, nothing, none whatsoever. And because I received a registered mail, I tried to contact the bylaw department. And I didn't get any communication with them. So, Four o'clock, I went to the bylaw department, tried to talk to somebody to find out what's going on. And the officer who wrote the letter, D. Klassen, apparently they couldn't find him. And two officers came down and try to access the file. They could not. So they phoned this declassing guy, and surprise, surprise, he was in the building. And five minutes later, he came down. Before that, I, tr I tried many times, four or five times, tried to phone him, but just answering and just a waste of time anyway. So anyway, he came down, and from the beginning, his attitude was judgmental, rude, threatening, and he started to show me the pictures. And I tried to find out what's wrong with it. So 
Anyway, long story short, he told me to get rid of everything. And then I said, are you threatening me? He didn't answer. And he said again, get rid of everything or we'll do the job and then charge you the cost. And I said, it's not you deciding that. And he said, you're pointing a finger at me. Meeting is over. He stormed out the meeting room. So is that what you're doing in this city? I certainly wouldn't take that kind of attitude from the city employee. We are the taxpayer paying the salary, good salary, I might add, to this guy, and he behaved like a king of Nanaimo. And anyway, I talked to Mr. Davidson a few days later. He agreed to come to see the property. He said he will be there. Uh, where is it? September 21st. He didn't show up. He didn't phone me. I wasted the entire day waiting for him. Next day, he phoned me. And he came over. And we look at the property. And he tried to start to add up more problem than the picture originally shown to me. Anyway, today, Mr. Bestwick came to see my property, and I'm not sure what he's thinking, but as far as I'm concerned, this problem is over-exaggerated abusive use of your authority, invasion of privacy, and then stifling the inventive people, creative people. And I certainly won't take this kind of BS from the city. Any questions? Well, sir, uh, first off, <clears throat> one of your neighbors has filed a complaint, yes. or somebody has filed a yes, complaint. Yes, I know. I am aware concerning of that. The, sir, we let you talk. I didn't interrupt you. So one of your neighbors or somebody else has filed a complaint about the condition of your property. And what we're trying to do is determine whether or not you're prepared to clean the property up to a higher standard than it apparently is now. Well, may I speak to you? Certainly. Okay. I'm aware that my neighbor, he's got a personal grudge against me and using the city as a tool to harass me. And I talked to another neighbor, right? across the street from me, across from him, he getting harassed by the city official the same way. This is obviously he has a problem. He loaned the mower every two, three days in summer. Obviously he's got something wrong in his head, but the city decide to side with him, harassing us, than tell him to stop complaining. And this guy is yelling at a kid, playing on the street, be quiet during the day. And our house, look at this house here. It's 50, 60 feet from the street. And obviously, I don't hear any noise, but apparently he does. And he complained to the kid. 
and then parents. And then resort to use the city property, city resource to harass the neighbor. That is not suddenly and the way behaved by law department employee behaved this day and age, that's not the way it goes. So what we've got here, sir, is we've got a complaint that's been filed against you, our, our, our bylaw enforcement uh, employees. Uh, have tried to uh, have tried to work uh, to work this something out here. Um, are you suggesting that you don't need to do any cleanup? You supposed to be fair and reasonable. You supposed to contact me before you send me a registered mail. Nobody contacted me. Apparently. If I can stop, if I can stop you here, sir, the fact is that you're in front of council now. You've received a registered letter. You've had Mr. Davidson uh, visit your property. I gather there were others that have visited the property. Otherwise, uh, we wouldn't have had these pictures today. What is it that we can do tonight that you will consider to be fair and reasonable? Drop the case. I have no problem, Mr. Davidson told me that I cannot make a, I have been, okay, if you have a time, let me, let me explain to you. I am an engineer, and then I used to work for Transit Commission in Ottawa, and I retired 25 years ago. I have been making a bicycle, electric bike, since then, 25 years. I made many, many bikes. I can show you the files by files by files. Many bikes. This is my life work. And I'm doing it in my property, in my workshop. And Mr. Davidson is telling me that I cannot even make one bike in that property. I have many bikes because I need many bikes. Because I modify, I chop them up, put them together, and make a, a new bike, different bike. It never existed before. Those bikes never existed in a world. This is the one of a kind vibes. And the newspaper article written, I will go Sir, to I wonder if I can ask you, do you do this as a hobby or as a business? No, this is absolutely as a hobby. Okay. I'm not making a penny. Okay. So, so that being said, unfortunately, your hobby appears to cause uh, some of your parts and accessories and bits and pieces uh, to be out in the open. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Everything is under the roof in my workshop. I use the carport as a workshop. As you can see, you cannot see anything here. I got a whole bunch of bikes inside. And then, so, what is your problem? So I, I, wonder if, I wonder if we could just stop you there. Mr. Davison, I wonder if you can shed some light on it. You visited the property. Uh, Your Worship, um, I did visit the property with our senior bylaw officer on September the 12th. Um, from this view that you're looking at uh, behind the pallet, there's a uh, snow, snow blower, a snow removal machine that um, by admission hasn't been run for at least two years. Um, the grass had grown up through it. In the backyard, uh, there was a number of um, what we would term derelict fire yard equipment, lawnmowers, um, tractors, etc., that looked like they hadn't been started or run for quite some time. Um, there was broken pieces of fence paneling that um, the owner said that he was going to reutilize. There was the pile of brush. Uh, the overall um, state of the yard would, would make it unsightly without the bike parts. 
Uh, we did discuss with him what he could do to bring the property into compliance with the bylaw. Um, it was generally a, a overall cleanup, um, get rid of some of the, um, the brush, get rid of some of the um, old lumber, get rid of some of the broken fence panels. Um, a, a small amount of that has been accomplished um, in whole. It hasn't changed greatly, and that's why we're before you this evening. Um, the uh, homeowner does have uh, a very extensive um, bicycle making project in his carport. Um, we didn't count. I would say that there's 30 plus bicycle frames in, in there and um, literally hundreds and hundreds of stripped down bicycle parts that he uses to create his bicycles. Um, this is an open carport. He's got tarps hung at the front. It's all glass to the side where uh, one of the neighbors lives. Um, the carport itself is, is quite unsightly because of the accumulation of bike parts. Um, there is building material that is leaned up and stacked around the house that uh, we recommended that he, he put in some of his outbuildings. Um, none of that was done either. So that's why we're before you this evening. Thank you. Councillor Bestwick. Thank you. Um, I, I know the gentleman's persistent and he's uh, been calling me for some time to please come to his property and, and uh, observe. And so late this afternoon, I wanted to go as late as possible uh, to see um, if there was any any changes in to what we had perhaps uh, read and I just want to address the uh, the bicycle parts and the scrap when I, when I was there today and I have pictures um, all of the bikes in his carport uh, working area uh, exterior to his uh, house under the carport you can't see unless you're standing inside the carport any of the bikes they're hanging from the ceilings they're in order sure there's parts and sure it'd be like nuts and bolts and and pieces of uh, wood if you were a carpenter and otherwise and but i couldn't see anything from the road and i couldn't see anything from a side yard and i couldn't see anything from a backyard as it relates to bike parts and and otherwise um could, could a weed eater be put to good use? Sure. The property slopes considerably. Uh, when you get into the backyard, uh, it's a significant drop off and a slope. And I, I'm uh, obviously these are all complaint driven. And while you may prefer to look at a manicured lawn and nice shrubbery and roses and things. I don't know it's for me to judge on whether or not this is uh, considerably unsightly to warrant the property maintenance bylaw being applied in this case. When we look at the front of the house, if the van was parked in the driveway, you say, you know, um, I quite honestly don't know what where the property maintenance bylaw complaint is, even if the car is parked and the horse parked. I, 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 I don't, you know, I, I don't see anything there that warrants the property maintenance bylaw. In my humble opinion, I can't see the bikes. Um, whether it's a tarp, gray tarp or not, regard it's irrelevant. Um, if I get into the backyard, sure, there's some branches and things that hopefully we'll have uh, yard waste pickup with our new uh, garbage trucks pretty soon. Um, but beyond that, if there's a, everything is tarped in the back, um, everything is laid beside an outbuilding with tarp, you can't see anything that's providing me with any concern I, sh I can drive around and imo all day long and find th this everywhere so who am i to say that that's wh what are we going what, what are we going to clean up there what are we going to force the gentleman to do just make sure that he parks his van in the driveway make sure that he has weed and feed in the in the i don't know like what 
You should take the moss off the roof. You probably should. You should probably take the moss off the roof. But uh, I don't know that it's for me to say that that is unacceptable living condition and it, it warrants a property maintenance bylaw intervention. So I support the gentleman's position that, you know, I sure hope I, when we spoke today, I said, I sure hope you clean it up. Like, I sure hope you get the weed eater out here and get your rake out and clean it up and stack things neatly if they aren't already. But I didn't see a whole lot that would bother me. Do you wish to move a motion to that effect? Uh, if you wish Good. to do it now or at the end of the, the whole thing. Okay, we'll, we'll hold on to that for a moment then. Councillor Fuller. From looking at the pictures, I've come to the same conclusion as uh, Councillor Bestwick did. That's his case among ourselves. I think that comes after he sits down and we start our decision-making yeah. process. So I'm asking there, for a I, ruling, I I'm asking you, for a ruling from the mayor. Thank you. So uh, my thought was that I there may be questions. Councillor, please, please. There may be questions uh, for the delegation, and there may, in fact, be questions for the delegation as we develop the motion, as we go through the motion. Absolutely agreed, but what I think I'm asking you to do is to restrict it to questions of the delegation rather than argument and putting forward a case right. among ourselves. Thank you. All right, so ready for, uh, ready for a motion? Do you have a question, Councillor Fuller? I do. And allowing Councillor Bestwick to talk about what he see, what I observe, and from what you're saying, I'm in agreement with uh, Councillor Kip. Yes, it does look like some stuff might need to be uh, cleaned up, put to the side, but I don't see a heck of a lot. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to straighten up some of the stuff? It's not so much getting rid of it, but I didn't see much to be straightened up. So I can see where you're coming from, but if you're willing to straighten it up, I can't see the issue here because well, are all of your bike parts and that under the carport and covered? Yeah, they were in all the bike, most of them is hung from the ceiling. I have a hook and then hung from the ceiling. Some, maybe one or two bike may be sitting on the floor because I walked on yeah. or I did something. Or maybe I forgot to put it away. Yeah. Anyway, it's not it's not like sitting on the on the outside in the rain. Yeah. It's under the cover. That's the reason why this portion here, I took a building permit specifically to put this extension to the carport so I can store the bicycle and then park. And then city consider this as a shed. So everything in there. What's the problem? It's not a problem. As far as I'm concerned. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions for the delegation? Move Thank you, sir. Mr. Nishikawa. Move receipt. Second, can I Councillor Bestwick? Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Councillor Bestwick, do you have a, do you have, wait a minute, before we get into our motion, I see a gentleman standing up here. I suspect this may be a neighbor or somebody else. You wish to speak to this address, sir? Just on uh, Mr. Chikawa's behalf. Okay. I think we're good. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yep. So before we get going on that one, let's just do this last one. 300 uh, Jade Avenue. Who's running the show here? 300 Jade Avenue. Is there anyone wishing to speak to 300 Jade Avenue? 300 Jade Avenue. 432 Howard Avenue. Four three two Howard. There we go. 
Is there anyone wishing to speak to 432 Howard? Councilor Brennan? I have a question about uh, 432 Howard, and that is, um, it says contaminated fill. Can you um, expand on that contamination a bit for me, please? Um, Council, yeah, it's meeting of June the 13th, uh, keep a remediation order to have the property cleared up of uh, uh, various discarded products, building materials. Um, in the 18 days after that uh, meeting, we, we give the owner that much time to, to start doing the cleanup. Uh, when we went on site at that time, you'll see the rather large piles of dirt that has been piled over top of the existing material that was on the property that council ordered removed originally. Um, when we showed up with our contractors to get a price to make a determination of how much it was going to cost to clean the property up, the contractors uh, took a look at the dirt and mentioned to the bylaw officer that it, in their opinion the dirt was contaminated and that they wouldn't be giving us prices to do any work on the property until such time as we had a uh, assessment done of the dirt. Um, subsequently, we have found that it has heavy metal contamination. It's got lead, tin, and zinc uh, beyond residential levels. Um, so we're asking council to, uh, to support our um, application here to have that over the dirt removed from the property so that we can get down to the original mess to have that removed as well. Thank you. So, <clears throat> Is there anyone wishing to speak to any of the addresses that I've read out? 559 7th Street, 611 7th Street, 218 View Street, 300 Jade Avenue, 432 Howard, and 1658 Sherwood. Seeing none, Councillor Bestwick. Thank you. I would so move that Council, pursuant to Property Maintenance Bylaw 1919, number 3704, direct the owners of the following properties to remove the materials as listed below from the premises within 14 days or the work will be done by the City or its agents at the owner's cost. Number one, number two, number five, number seven, and number eight. Okay, seconded by Councillor Fuller. Thank you. Any discussion? Staff right. Ma'am. Oh, I was going to speak after we're finished this. Oh, okay, this great. Part. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kipp. Um, yeah, this is an interesting one because it's very, um, it, it's, it's very hard sometimes to judge some of these. And I guess we don't have that um, standards and maintenance bylaw. And we don't have one, but we seem to enforce this messy yard thing. I really find from my perspective, I'd prefer to have a standards and maintenance and us to go chasing places I'll just bring up like um, what's the one in Harewood that we know so then that we could actually fix those places versus chasing the individual residential buildings as much as we do um, from my perspective it is um, and, and we have heard before that the people feel quite um, invaded uh, they feel that the, you know that they don't know why the staff is there they don't they're not aware of the stuff and it, it is a tough one and for me I wish we had a standards and maintenance bylaw that we could have consistent pictures of what we expect and that uh, because um, I'm not a green lawn person, can't stand them. I know other people love them and I would suggest that we're getting caught up in from what I hear is uh, not for me, it's not the type of public service that this counselor wants. I want to work with people. When the guy comes by and I mean the explanation I get is like the staff person's there, but you didn't want to talk to them. And I understand that sometimes. Because there's people I don't want to talk to. And there's times when people don't want to talk to me either. But we have to become public servants. Because we are public servants. Although I've heard from administrators before that we don't work for the public as staff. And we don't. We're just accountable to council and that's all. But I want people to be accountable to the public. And I'm finding when I hear these complaints consistently... It seems like, and it's a tough one. This would be a tough to walk onto somebody's property and say, that's dirty, that's dirty, that's dirty. Get rid of it, get it out of here. We're going we're gonna to tear it out. I've had the worst thing I've ever seen here. The worst thing I've ever seen here was an incident when the police came about a guy who had a property that was a problem. So this has been going on for years for me, and I'm having a real problem. I a lot of times don't even raise my hand to vote in favor of these. So I believe we have to look at how we approach these. And I even go into the one, the guy had a, a, a rancher up on Bowen Road and the staff was inside looking for a suite. 
and spent 15 minutes in his property when it wasn't there and he videoed it. So these are the type of things that are happening that have to be brought to our public and brought to this table as what I would consider a better public service is what I'm looking for. Thank you. Thank you. I see no further questions. I will call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Show Councillor Brennan opposed. Do you have any alternative, uh, Council, do you have any alternative for 1658 Sherwood Drive? Seeing none, move on to the next item. So, sir, you're not required. Thank you. Next item, property maintenance bylaw, or pardon me, property maintenance for industrial property. There Excuse me, Your Worship. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I think just um. Yes, I'm sorry, Ms. Anderson. That's okay. Legislative Services staff are recommending to move through the agenda priority items that um, we take. Item 7D, the property maintenance for the industrial property, as well as item 9B, which is human trafficking, and move it to follow Section 15, which is the core service report and delegations. We are also recommending that section nine, is it, sorry, that section 10 bylaws precede section eight corporate services so that we do the bylaws right now. Do the bylaws right now. Section 10, move to section Prior 10. to the property maintenance? We're moving the property maintenance to the uh, end of the agenda to proceed section 15. Great, thank you. So next one, can you give me a cheat sheet by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> Danny. This one, all this one. Very good. Very good. Okay. So, if we could move on, ladies and gentlemen. And that is, excuse me, councillors. Councillors, item number 10 bylaws with no accompanying report. Next item. First off, a motion, councillors. A motion that officers appointment and delegation amendment bylaw number 2016-7031.05 to update the list of city officers be adopted. Moved by Councillor Hong. Seconded, Seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Next item. Motion that, count, that zoning amendment bylaw 2015 number 4500.078 to rezone 3425 Uplands Drive from single dwelling residential R1 to townhouse residential R6 be adopted. Do we have a mover? <laughs> Moved by Councillor Kep. Is there a seconder? Do we know where we're dealing with? Councillor Hong, thank you. Could you please direct me to the specific uh, page where... Item 10B. 10B. Would be in the original agenda. Your Worship is in the addendum, actually. Oh, pardon me. Okay, it's on the green sheets. And the story about it is where do, where do I where do I find the 10 B so where do I find the accompanying in, oh no accompanying report so there's no accompanying report so can somebody please tell me what I'm approving Bylaw to amend the City of Nanaimo bylaw to 2011 number 4500, and it's on page 10 and 11 of the addendum sheets. I 
I think it's on the addendum because the second page, Schedule A, wasn't on the page. Right. property, is this the one? Hmm. This is the bylaw for it. I've got that. Yes, it, it will doesn't, be. It doesn't tell me anything. Here and here. Right, so thank you. So um, it really doesn't give me a considerable amount of information, but nonetheless, when we had delegations come then, if this is the property that I think it was, there was concerns about access and egress. There was concerns about fencing. There was concerns about trees and, and, re, and trees and, and flora and fauna and things being replanted. Um, there was concerns about density. There was concerns about a, uh, a number of things related to. So this goes back. If this goes back into November, or this goes back into a year ago, when when this was first brought to us. I think <coughs> if this is the property that I'm thinking of. So have all of those concerns and issues been vetted through the wherever that would go, the design advisory panel, go back to them, and they would be wonder, saying yes. I wonder if I can help you with that. So it says that it passed first reading on, on June 15th, passed second reading on June 15th. This is 2015. 2015. Passed, it went through a public hearing on November, uh, November 5th, 2015, and passed third reading that evening. And I would imagine that it, third reading would have been, uh, with, would have been uh, subject to Covenant res registration, which took place 2016, Excuse September 16th. Me. So everything that you're referring to has been dealt with. So for confirmation, then, the covenant of 2016, September, addressed what issues? Um, because we... W would I know what they were on September the 16th? Did I vote on them on the 16th? Um, it would have been included in the original package that went to Council with first and second reading, an outline of, of the, uh, of the, sorry, of the uh, covenant, and it would have likely have been discussed um, at the public hearing. In general, it'll be uh, securing density on the site and uh, the community contributions. Many of the other issues um, that Councillor Beswick has raised. I would, I would ask Council to keep in mind that this is simply a rezoning. We'd still need to go through development permit, and many of those issues around site design would, would be addressed through the development permit process. Okay. All right. yep. So the mo motion has been, uh, the recommendation has been moved and seconded. Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Where next? 9A. 9A, thank you. Nine A. Lower Colliery Dam, Auxiliary Spillway Final Costs. The purpose is to advise Council that the Lower Colliery Dam Auxiliary Spillway has been constructed and to provide a summary of the design and construction costs. We have two delegations, uh, probably three now. Mr. Leon Cake being the first. Thank you, Your Worship. Leon Cake, 59th, 36, going away. Just going to go through a, a few points and then just address a couple of questions if I could. Sort of walk us back in time where we started. Just one thing, so Council is aware, uh, on our lower and middle dam since about 2003, we've had 64 reports on the lower, and the lower and middle dam consultants, reviews, whatever. We've had 64 different reports. I just want to take you back to the KCB remark in one of their letters that they had reassessment of options for the middle and lower Chase River dams. Various studies have been completed on the subject dams. As a result of these studies, the dams are, are classified as, as extreme consequence dams and are viewed by the province, the, uh, by the British Columbia Dam Safety Branch 
as the two as the two highest hazard dams in the province of British Columbia. I don't think anybody can believe that today. There was an article in the paper that uh, referred to a few things that I thought I might just address if we go back to the reports. And thank God we didn't use this report. But it says in the, in the paper that, uh, Mayor McKay, you said that the uh, dams were less than originally anticipated, which was between 10 and 15 million. Well, the KCB report of 2013, to replace both dams in the existing locations, the budget was 8.6 million. So luckily we didn't go down that path because I would have to say that by looking at this and what we spent to date on just one dam, $7 million, this might have quadrupled. Looking at the lower spillway cost of $4.4 million, I think if we go back and look where we began this journey for something that studies after study has contradicted each other, gave us information that in some cases I feel like we just chased our tail to the next one. Have we spent million dollar, $7 million doing that? Things I see in reports that today, um, leading up to the assessment that the city's going to do, I see many, many times in, in, in many, many reports, our due diligence did not happen. Our instructions of putting in rain gauges, putting in SCADA systems, putting in monitoring devices, maintenance procedures themselves. Three weeks ago, four weeks ago maybe now, there was a little sit-down gathering at the uh, lower dam. And Ms. Samer was there with some of the, the staff. And I pointed out about the log that's been laying across, the dead log that's been laying across the far side, which has been there for such a long time. And it's still laying there. And now I would say don't touch it because we've lowered the level of the dam that doesn't matter who you are, there has been an adjustment to the ecosystem in that lower dam now. When I look back at this article, and it's an article, when I see some of the comments about what we're looking at doing in the review, the dam safety assessment, when I see the word hydraulic, hydraulic modeling is what got us into this problem. We never ever really had proper data that gave us the ability to say, we have this much water. And I see now in this article that we're looking at maybe doing that. Well, we did that in April of 2002. Middle and lower Chase River Dams spillway hydrology studies using information, again, that I hope in the assessment, because I have reviewed the assessment, which I believe, if I'm correct, Ms. Samer, is that the one on the website? There's a, there's a report on the website that says that there's been a report done for 20, February 2016. Is that the assessment report? Okay, well, there's a report on the, web, on the website, which is concerning to me because I look at it and I start to see some of the parameters around the discussion of what may be done in the middle dam. Oh, let me, oh, I can stop you there. Um, some of the terminology in the letter from the ministry suggests that there was a study, but it's just an exchange of letters, and we haven't commenced any work on that yet. We've got invitations out to meet with the community representatives and members to go over what's been done to date, see what we have in hand, and talk strategy at moving forward for the Middle Dam. So the Middle Chase River Dam, Dam Safety Assessment, February 16, 2016, by Golden Associates, is not a report? No. I don't have it in front of me, so I'm not able to see what well, you're referencing. Well, I, I look at this report, and there's things in there, again, I see as spending a whole bunch more money for assessments that after three years, four years now, of a lot of information that's been gathered about stability and strength and, and volume of water and all those things, <clears throat> I hope we're not going to go and go down the wrong path again, gathering this information to prove that these two little ponds are not the worst dams in all of British Columbia. And we spend a lot of money finding that out. Yeah. The only last thing I have here 
There's a, there's a request for a proposal right now, which, you know, I look at when we spend money on consultants, and this, is, this would be 65, number 65. We have a request for engineering consultant service for review and design of the dam log booms. In 2013, from 2009, <coughs> reports identified for Jump Creek and South Fork the log booms, the log booms, the log booms. And now we have a request for a proposal on how to install these log booms. We just put a log boom at the lower dam. What is the difference between asking for consultants to tell us how to do it when we just did it at the lower dam? I look at how much is this going to cost to tell us from reports that we had from other consulting engineering firms that we needed to do it back from almost 2009 coming forward. So I look at that and I go, please, <clears throat> I'm about my tax dollars. I'm about how much money we're spending in our community for two of the smallest ponds. If you go up there right now and you, and you look at that devastated lower dam, it's probably about 15 feet deep of water. When I look and I see reports that talk about cascading effect, failure of the lower dam, I'm asking this council to support our city manager as we go forward to stop chasing our tail, stop the bleeding of the taxpayers. We have to come to a realization. Does anybody who sits at council know what a one in 34,000 year event looks like and could put your hand up and say, yes, I totally believe in a one in 34,000 year event, which the province of British Columbia put us in to spend $7 million and look at the rainfall that we've had in the last few years, look at the fact of the hydrology that we've never done. We took rain gauge information from the east coast of Vancouver Island. We extrapolated information that put us in a category to spend $7 million and we didn't stop it. I'm asking on the next time around, which is going to be coming up, the middle dam, Council, Mayor, get engaged. Don't let this happen. There used to be a crowd of people in here supporting the dams, fighting for them. All the dams have done in this community is broke relationships, created anger, created sadness, made a park that you walk into that has got some god-awful spillway. And as a little boy that went up there all the time in his life, that's why I'm here. That's why I'll be here all the time. Because I grew up there. So I'm just asking. If we're going to spend any more money, build a washroom, put some picnic tables in, put some water fountains, give it a beautiful paint over, spend real money and get real value for real things. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Questions for the delegation? Councilor Kipp. Mr. Cake. You and I are people of special interest in this. I appreciate all the work you do in coming forward to speak and bring forward the things you bring forward. I much appreciate that. And I know my personal special interest with this. 62 reports on those dams. Do we have a figure of including that in that 10 million I always talk about? <clears throat> we finding now with our hotel reports, the first dam report that said there was no steel, 62 reports outstanding that talk about and now we've got to get a report to put a boom in that we've already done and we should have done for years it seems like we get a lot of reports and nothing happens i'm disappointed um thank you very much for the stuff you bring forward and i appreciate the pressure you're put under to do it thank you and all i can say is i hope council and mayor i don't go on deaf ears that you get proactive and you stand up to the provincial government and show the taxpayers you've got brave, courage council members. Thank you. Thank you. Question through to staff. We'll receive the delegation. Seconder? Second. Councillor Hong, thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Question through to staff. Do we have a list of the 62 reports and have we reviewed them? What has been done and what hasn't been done? 
I, I guess I know the answer to that, so it's not even worth answering. Currently, with the state the dam is in and drawn down over two meters, I was there today just to take another look. Have we ground proof what is there? Have we been documenting, picturing, taking pictures, measurements of what's there as a physical dam right now? Because I, I look at that. What was done in this last week should have been done before we did any of these million dollar studies or any of the boondoggle that I call that, that concrete slab in the middle of the clear cut. And if you remember clearly, and I love to bring these up again, when we were talking about a 0.5 death ratio taking to the 1 in 10 was when I brought up that 18 people dying of fentanyl two years ago. We spent more time and money on this trying to prove me wrong or whoever you don't like. You've been trying to prove me wrong for so long. I've been working for the last few days hectically on my conflicts of interest trying to find out why we've done this. It's really frustrating. We need to hire another consultant to put in a boom and we sit here and just accept that. That Did we say that? Did, did we say from one of those studies as a council staff, did we say, excuse me, did we say to get a boom study after we've had two or three of them that said, I mean, I've read them. I don't think any other people have read them. It's supposed to be in our number one water supply. It's supposed to have been there years ago. And I think there's an earlier study that says it should have been done when I was pulling carcasses of elk out of there. So from my perspective, wow, I, I, <laughs> Mr. Davidson hasn't won yet from my perspective, and the provincial government owes me $7 million. What I could have got for $7 million in the rest of our community, and we're still going on, we, we eliminated from hundreds of people involved down to a committee, down to a, a couple of people that make decisions now. I, I'm so disappointed. And this is just one example I've got my water audit that I asked from 2010 to sit down with staff and review. Yeah. Mr. Cameron. So, uh, so uh, are we ground proof? Have we ground proof and measured what is there and taken pictures of it now with the water drowned down? So I'm going to respond to a number of the different questions, including one that was asked by Mr. Cake. So I think the document that you're referencing was the February 16, uh, 2016. Yeah, so I'm getting my years, the years going by quickly. <laughs> uh, that's a PowerPoint presentation that um, Golder prepared for a delegation of staff and Mr. Solomon to go down to the Dan Safety Branch and do an update on all the work that the city had done to date. So it was quite a long PowerPoint presentation outlining the work that had been done and started to uh, suggest that uh, the city wished to approach the middle dam in a different way and use a risk-based approach to dealing with any concerns dam safety may have with the middle dam and having that initial dialogue. Uh, we haven't commissioned anything since that date with the consultants. We have sent out an invitation to meet with the groups that has gone out. So there's going to be a discussion of the community and stakeholder uh, people that are interested in the Cullery Dam situation to go over what's been done, to take a look at the list of all the different reports that have been generated. Uh, staff did put together four binders of the corporate record for uh, the studies and the commissions and the meetings and the minutes and the legal bills and the motions and the briefing notes. And so all of the corporate documentation pertaining to the Cullery Dams so we have that information in front of us, and I imagine that'll be a long uh, meeting with a lot of conversation to take stock of where we've been, figure out what our approach might be going forward, and prepare for our next set of meetings with the dam safety branch. So that's where we are. Um, I initially thought we'd get to that work in September, but a number of other projects have taken, um, taken up the time, and we're now in the position to have that conversation. So that's, we do have the information, we do have it there. Have I actually gone through it myself and read each of the ports? No, I haven't, but I do have it accumulated. And um, with Mr. McCray joining us to be working in that area, he's going to take the lead uh, and support on the colliery dams and work with public works and engineering and uh, get out in front of that. In terms of the booms, I think that's pertaining to other dams, not these two. We haven't asked for a boom study to be done on the middle or the lower. And in terms of groundproofing, I'll defer to Mr. Rosen to 
respond to any well, of those if questions. If I can respond to the booms, we've asked for an installation methodology. We just went through one. What do we learn from paying all these consultants that the next time we want something, we hire the same guy to give us the same report? It's frustrating. I mean, what can we do? Our staff installed that boom. They should be able to order other booms, the links, and anchor it the same way. I know we had that problem with the pipe crossing. It took us four or five years to get that pipe crossing upstream fixed, and I don't know why these things take that long. Do you understand the pipe crossing? We argued for years that it was failing, and everybody argued against it. Just like they argued that this dam was going to fall, and just like they argued there was a risk downstream that we've done nothing to. That flood is coming, and we've opened up another gate to let the flood hit Harewood. What are we doing as a council when we allow this risk to continue and we boondoggle? It's this council's fault. Thank you, Ms. Samra. Just other than that, we have Mr. McRae. He has a fresh set of eyes to start working with staff on this and addressing the range of concerns that we have. I'm thankful to have... Took a sample of it, chipped away. We done that. We groundproofed that stuff from our old studies. Can we, we did it can above we, the water? Can we before. move on? Can we move on. No, I want to know if we groundproofed. So the answer is yes. We have been doing that work, doing the inspections, and we'll continue to work on that. And in our engagement Excuse with the me, stakeholders, or, yeah, like a dam safety inspection, or are we groundproofing the reports we've had that said? There wasn't concrete or the measurements of it, or the thickness or how big the walls are or where the dam ended. Have we confirmed any of that with that lake drawn down? What I'm trying to get at is that should have been done before we did anything. It was negligence on our part to not draw that down and look at what we had. And that would have reduced some of the risk at that point too. This has been so frustrating since 2012. A lot of people in a big state of depression over this and a constant fight. In fact, now I find out I have people searching me out Staff going out to talk to the bloggers for me. I'm impressed. Thank you. Next speaker, Mr. Robert Fuller. Uh, ground proof has been done. I could expect to see some information on that if I asked for it. I will have to check into how we're handling that. Actually, Mr. McRae will be checking into that and he'll report back. Well, if I'm told that it's there and been done, then it should be available. Thank you. This one ain't going away from me. I hope you're Mr. Realize. Fuller. On it. I found out something new tonight. 62 freaking reports on these two tiny little ponds. These must be, without a doubt, the most studied bodies of water in this province. And we still don't have all the answers. What are we spending all that freaking money on? Now I'll start. Imagine, if you will, a one in 34,000 year storm. To break it down, and I'm going to use figures from the US Geological Survey, and because some hydrologists don't like to go one in 34,000, or one in 500,000, or one in 50,000. What it works out to is a 0.00294% chance that a major storm event may, and I stress may occur in any given year if, and only if, all other factors including hydrological studies of the applicable drainage area, including rainfall statistics in that watershed, soil permeability, the effects of human development, that being logging, soil degradation, roads, housing, and so forth, rainfall gauge statistics, and flooding information from other areas and drainages while they may be interesting, should not come into play. Every drainage area is completely different from others. 
That means that you don't use the rainfall statistics from the West Coast. You don't use drainage studies from the Englishman River. Or the Cowichan River, for that matter. The Chase River drainage area is an entity all unto itself, completely different from any other drainage on this island, and for that matter, probably the world. For this and other reasons, we have been gifted with what I can only consider a massive cement monstrosity in the middle of our park. I have yet to see a risk assessment and remediation plan for what will happen when the waters of this Noah's Ark type flood reach downstream from the spillways. No more studies, please. I've yet to see the numbers from a simple flow meter study taken at either the lower or middle spillway. Flow numbers have been raised or lowered as to computer programs, but as far as I know, no one has actually performed this task. These two little lakes and dams are perhaps the most studied in our province, and yet after all these years, and 62 freaking studies, we are still left with questions unanswered and being asked to do more more hydrological studies, more core samples, more requests for studies into possible remediation of the middle dam, overtopping, another spillway, another possible few million dollars to be <coughs> spent in the quest to deem these two little lakes safe. What more is it gonna take? When will it finally come time to say we have done our due diligence. We have undertaken all of what has been asked. When is our park and its surrounding ecosystem going to be left alone to heal? The community has borne the brunt of these expenditures, the monies, and the intrusion into our park. Some of you folk on council have spent more years than you probably wish on this exercise. Colliery Dam Park has been ripped apart in this quest for safety. Mother Nature has the great ability to heal itself, but will we? Trust between citizen, city, and elected official has eroded and may never be rebuilt. Trust between folk once united in a common cause has been destroyed. Relationships ripped asunder, friendships broken. Fear of what may happen, fear of what will happen. Name calling, bickering, infighting. People are angry, people are hurt, people feel betrayed. It's like our community has been held hostage. This is not democracy, this is a tragedy. When will the madness end? When will common sense prevail? In the end, it will be left to you folk, our elected representatives and city staff on how to proceed further. It will be up to you on how much more is spent. It will be up to you on how to proceed to rebuild the trust which we should be able to count upon. <coughs> This is all we can count on. Let common sense prevail. And one final note. I don't know if any on council have read this. I would like to hope so. And if you don't, I sure hope you read it soon. And go to page 27. This was prepared by Golder. It's the Middle Chase River Dam Dave Dam Safety Assessment, February 16, 2016. And go to page 27. Potential middle dam options. These are just potential, but we've been through this all before. 
additional monitor and data collection, including additional data collection, hydrology, dam condition, coring if required, monitoring for storm events. I think we do that already. Spillway improvements, overtopping protection. We've been through this all before. How many freaking millions of dollars are we going to go in to our pockets for money that could be well spent in this city on other projects to satisfy the province. Thank you. Thank you. I get a Councilor Four. Questions uh, for the delegation? Yeah. yeah. Do you recall um, one of Golder's reports going back that mentioned the like that uh, if we did the auxiliary spillway, the likelihood of having to do anything up at the middle dam would be minimal to negligible? I recall that from one of the reports. I can't remember which it is. Do you recall I, that? I recall exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, and so, so and I can't place yeah. it. So you, you do recall it. I recall it. I'm sure I could find it. I'm sure if I asked Mr. Cake, he would recall it. And yet, we have Golder doing another report that is saying the complete opposite. I'm, I'm reading the one you were talking about, actually, which confused me because on the city website it says February 17th. <laughs> so, well, it's February 16th. I know it was actually done on the 16th. Yeah. It was put up on the 17th. These I are guess. these are only potential. Yeah. Yes, damage. exactly, exactly. It's all potential. This report yeah. in page 27, in specific, yep. is a recipe to print money. Yeah, Simple. and and actually, it starts at page one. And well, goes on and on and on and corroborates that recipe to print money. Uh, I, I don't want any more reports. I think we've had enough reports. We've spent millions of dollars on reports. 62. Uh, they talk about in this one, they actually talk about um, using the lower dam and the seismic stuff to extrapolate what might be with the middle dam and seismic stuff. And then later on they talk about huh. doing... Uh, Drilling, Imagine if that. necessary. You're talking yeah. about seismic again. Yes, exactly. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, this totally astounds me. The waste of money that has been spent on this for a one in thirty-four thousand year risk, uh, less than half half a person dying if the flood happened. You know, I'm we've got we've gone from a six foot flood down in the floodplain yeah. to a matter of inches. Yeah, Councillor, do you have any questions for the delegation? Well, I, I want to thank you for coming up, and I want to thank you for bringing the information you bring forward and what you, Mr. Cake, what Mr. Wagger, and other people have done. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, see no further questions. Motion to receive the delegation. Moved, Moved by Councillor Kipp, seconded by Councillor Fuller. Call a question. All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. Next delegation, Mr. Terry Wager. Thank you. I live at 71 Caledonia Avenue. I've been involved with the dam situation quite intensively since 2013. And uh, I voted for some of the people in this council because uh, I was told by them that they would, you know, do their best to preserve the integrity of our park up there. Not just the dam, but the park. And uh, I was at the council meeting where I saw you all vote 9 nothing to uh, put that uh, spillway up there. And uh, as we now know, it cost approximately $7 million or so. And uh, we all know that it was never proven to be a need. Nobody ever proved that it was needed. And yet, we're going to pay seven million or whatever for it. And that's your fault. You say it's because, uh, you know, the people down in Victoria forced you to do it. Well, that may be and that may be not. But uh, to me, it just looks like, well, a chicken bleep way out of it. 
and uh, the nine nothing vote. And then afterwards, everybody being all happy about it. I'll remember that next time it comes for an election. That's all I can say about that. But uh, as far as the middle dam goes, it's still the same story. Nothing's been proven to be needed. The people down in Victoria are still ogres that might threaten us. And you guys will still be faced with the situation of what to do. And this is all your legacy at the current point. Two years or so almost into your mandate as this council, that is the legacy that you have presented to Nanaimo. The auxiliary spillway at the Colliery Dam Park. And then sometime next year you will decide what to do about the middle dam. And then the year after that the election will come again. So if that's all you guys have on the plate to, for people to look at, there's going to be a lot of people that are probably going to be unhappy with you. I'm thinking all those people that voted for you because of the dams, well, they might not want to vote for you anymore because of the dams. So, it's just a factor. But more so than that, I really hope that you will do what is right. You know, ever since the beginning, what we were always saying to you was, there's no proof of anything here. Make them prove it. Stand up to them. While you didn't make them prove it, and you didn't stand up to them. So, I ask that, you know, you consider that it's not too late, and that the next time the big bully threatens you, you tell him to take off. And no more 9 nothing votes to cave in to the big bully. That's very disappointing. Thank you. Questions? Councillor Kipp? No. no. Councillor Fuller, questions yeah, for the delegation? I have a question for the delegation. And sarcasm is intended here. Uh, it's totally intended. You are aware that the original cost estimate was $4,544,045,000, and it actually came in at $4,463,000. We actually came in under budget on this one. You are aware of that, aren't you? Yay. Uh, see, and I, I knew you would be thrilled, as I am thrilled. And we look at the $7 million cost and on and on and on. And yes, what might end up happening at the Middle Dam. Uh, well, I see in the reports for the Middle Dam there that uh, uh, there's uh, overtopping considerations being considered. So, you know, you might want to tack another million dollars on. Okay, so, so you recall also that at one point we had talked to a company, about, I believe it was GSI, about doing some overtopping, and then it got thrown back at us by Golder that, wait a minute, these people aren't qualified to do this. Then they were invited to come down to the lower one and withdrew because they were totally being ignored. You're aware of that as well? And they're one of the only ones that could do that type of overtopping. Well, to be honest, Councillor, that just sounds like more talk to me at this moment. Yep. No, I still was, remember that. Yeah. You're one of the people that voted 9 nothing to put that auxiliary spillway up there. Yep. And I saw how happy you were about it. And you know what, Terry? If you don't vote for me next time, I'm fine with that. I am. And that talk is because, cheap. Well, you come up here and do the talking. Okay. We did. We, right we now. gentlemen, no, we're not getting anywhere with this. You asked me to come back here. I'm I know. To you. And I agree with you. Do you I have any further questions for the delegation? Uh, no, not at all. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kipp, do you have a question for the delegation? We'll receive the delegation. Thank you very much. Second. Do we have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Hong. Thank you. All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Yes. I have my mic on. I just want to respond to that. Um, I'll never get sucked in again to vote for the team vote. It was one of the worst things I did. We tried to come up with five or six different things, a review of what was done, and that's what I was voting for that day. Yeah, you picked one part of it you didn't like, and I don't like that blob out there either. But I went along with my team to try and reconcile, try and get things done, and asked for a real independent investigation. I got squelched at every level. My FOI shows the background information. That was one of the worst votes I've ever done in my life to try and build a team. And it's done nothing to do that. And I feel disappointed with myself that I voted for that to try and get some reconciliation and an investigation, which 
eventually will come out. Mm -hmm. There's enough information. Right from our strategic water plan in 2007, the same people have been have met then. It's our staff, it's VHA, it's the dam safety branch. The same people are listed in our strategic water plan, 2007, Appendix A. You look at the list. It's the same people we fought all the way through this. We have fought bureaucracy. Bureaucracy pushed us into this. We didn't have the guts to stand up to the province. Oh, we were going to get sued. Oh, we're going to do this. Oh, no, sir, can we move on, please? Well, yeah, I'll we move a, on. We've got a very I'm, full agenda. Uh, well, it's a full agenda, yeah, and we've got a couple hours here. And I don't get to say my opinion on these reports we keep getting that are flawed. You just seem to accept them. I'm not I like think, you. I think, I think you've uh, made your point. Have I? Have I really made my point? Can we move on, Councillor, please? Sure, move on. Thank That's you. what you like to do. Just move on. Thank forget you. the mistakes. Can we get a motion to receive the report, please? Councillor Brennan, seconder. To receive the report. Seconded by Councillor Beswick. Any further discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favour? Opposed? Posed by Councillor Kipp and Councillor Fuller to receive the report. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Armstrong, I wonder if I could, for our, uh, our IT folks, uh, I wonder if you could change the name on the screen here. If it were up to them, I'd be calling you Ms. Anderson. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Armstrong, what's next? Your Worship, it's the Bezen, uh, Bebin Plaza Utility Upgrade. The item number? 9C. 9C. Thank you. So, Bevan Plaza Utility Upgrade Budget Transfer, and the purpose to advise Council of a 156000 budget transfer, dollar budget transfer to accommodate the budget shortfall for the Bevan Plaza Utility Upgrade Project. Move, staff's recommendation. Move the recommendation. Seconded by Councillor Brennan. Thank you. Any discussion? Councillor Bestwick? Uh, no. no. Okay. Thank you. Call the question then. All those in favour? Opposed? Motion carries. D is in Delta. 9D. Okay. Thank you. Development permit number DP1007 at 1680 and 1690 Town Site Road. And the purpose is to present, present Council with a development permit amendment application for two mixed use buildings at 1680 and 1690 Town Site Road, lots A and B respectively. And we have a delegation, Train Developments, on behalf of CMTC Architect. And the delegation is where? Come on down. If we could just have your name and your uh, city of origin, please. Sounds good. Chad Davidson. I'm the development manager for Train Developments, and we're based in Kelowna. Thank you. So, good evening, Mayor McKay and Council. Thank you very much for your time this evening. I understand it's valuable and you have a full agenda tonight, so I will be brief in my comments. Um, I, I am the, as I mentioned, the development manager for Train Developments. Um, we're here today accompanied by Corey Mackis, our vice president. Um, just here. Uh, Chris Chung, our registered coordinating professional and architect from CMTC Architects, and Dan Casey from Boulevard Transportation. So quickly, a, a rundown of who we are. Uh, Train Group is a BC-based development and construction company. We specialize in uh, building mid-market rental apartments in infill locations in cities that have a, an express need for rental units. Um, our most recent project is the one right here in Nanaimo at 1680 and 1690 Townsite Road. So construction has commenced on the first building and uh, it's progressing nicely. We have engaged a number of local trades and supply companies uh, to complete the work. As you may already be aware, uh, the project was designed by a uh, local developer, Ken Gruel of KSG Consulting. Uh, we purchased this project in the spring and have been working with the building and planning department uh, over the summer to finalize permitting. 
Ken spent a great deal of time laying the groundwork for what we believe is an excellent project. The initial plans for the site included large penthouse suites. However, our intention is to address a local demand and provide high quality rental units for the community. The res results of this change in scope are what brings us in front of you today and, and what constitutes your council package in front of you. So in cooperation with your building and planning staff, we have determined the changes needed uh, to present an application that both, both meets our goals and the requirements of the City of Nanaimo. To that end, we're, we're very thankful for staff's work in, their, in putting together their council report. There are a couple of charts in there that uh, identify the original development permit and then what's being asked for under the amended permit. It does a great job of laying it out and the differences. So I'll stop there. Uh, Dan Casey is here. Uh, he can answer any questions you might have about the, part, uh, the project's parking or transportation requirements. Uh, Corey, Chris and I are here. We can answer any general questions about the project. Um, so thank you for your time and input, and we're, we're really happy to be here tonight to present our project. Thank you. So we do have a couple of questions for you. Councillor Hong. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming, gentlemen. I just, I have a problem, not with the variance, if this was an apartment building, but when you add commercial into a mix, and then we're reducing the amount of parking that you're requiring and increasing the capacity, where are customers of, of these commercial properties going to park? You know, that's, that's always my concern. If, if you were scrapping all this commercial and just went straight, I would be fair and give you the same variance that we gave to the people next door. Mm -hmm. Saying that, that being said, they didn't have commercial. When you're not telling me what the 165 square meters on one and 122 are going to be for parking, how much room is that going to consume? Like, what if you decide to put a gym in there and you have 50 members coming? Where are you going to park 50 cars? You know, commercial mixed with residential is great. I love that concept. But when you require parking variances in an area that I think we're pushing the boundaries on parking already, I have concerns about, so do you know what you're going to have for commercial in these spaces? Actually, I misstated earlier, I'll field that one, I won't pass that one over to Dan. Actually, the commercial parking component is the one area um, we are not asking for a variance in. Uh, although the total count is within variance, the commercial stall stalls are within the requirements for the commercial space. Thank you. Councillor Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. Through you to the uh, delegation, thank you, gentlemen, for being here this evening. My question also relates to parking, and I just I want your help uh, understanding because maybe I'm misreading, but on page 22 of our agenda, I see uh, the variances reduce the required on-site parking from 48 to 38 spaces for Building 1, reduce the on-site parking from 44 to 35 parking spaces for Building 2 or Lot B, but then when I look down at the charts that you referred to, uh, the one at the bottom of page 22 and the one at the top of page 23 in my agenda, I see different numbers. And I see previous proposal for lot A, 38 parking spaces, and for the current proposal, it stays at 38. So is that, am I misreading something or is there a misprint there? And the same for the other chart. I see numbers that don't, that don't jibe. Thank you. Mr. Chair, sorry, you were sure, can I jump in here? Because this is staff's, re staff's reports. So I think it's best that maybe uh, I try to respond to that. The, the uh, top of page 22 is summarizing the variances that were approved under the, pre the previous development permit. So I, if Council's not aware, there was a previous development permit that was approved approximately two years ago now. If you actually go out on site, you'll see that Building A is well under construction. It's, it's uh, probably fully framed in. Uh, by this point. Um, what In real, in real uh, summary of what's being asked for tonight is an amendment to the second building, the one is yet to start construction, and to move from what was originally a penthouse to allow for four additional dwelling units. So it's the four additional dwelling units, the parking created by those four additional dwelling units, which are asking for an additional variance. There is one additional parking space that's been provided on site. So the DP that was uh, approved did have variances in place for the commercial and, and, uh, and residential, it was previously approved, 
and is currently valid and is being constructed on. So this is specifically tonight about four additional dwelling units. So if I may, then that answers my question and I did misread, so it's my fault. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Floor. I'm, I'm confused with the parking as well. Uh, it's mentioned that the commercial parking spaces are what are equal to what is required for the commercial parking but it seems to me they're all lumped in and so I'm trying to figure out uh, if we're providing commercial space that wasn't provided before does that mean we're actually creating less parking spaces for the apartment units which we're getting the same amount of Yeah. Your Go Worship, can, can I try again? So the, um, there'll be one additional parking space on site, but there's an additional, there's an addition of four dwelling units in, in building B or in building two on lot B. Um, so that results in an increased demand. So it, it results in a higher amount of parking um, that's required. So overall, if you would have looked at the original proposal that was approved two years ago, they required 92 parking spaces. This revised proposal now requires 100 parking spaces. The original proposal uh, proposed 73, but the new application is moving to, to 74. So overall, the, the variance that was given two years ago allowed for a 19 stall variance. This application that's before you uh, this evening is asking for then a 26 stall variance. So it was 19, now they want 26 variants. Yeah, that's right. So the additional stalls are a factor of the new residential, primarily a result of the new residential, the four new residential units being added to the second building. Still confuses me. I'm still confused over it. Sorry. Can't wrap my head around uh, Commercial parking being the right amount and commercial being added to the thing and yet the number of parking spaces are the same as they were before. So to me that means there will be less parking spaces for the residential than there were before. And that's what I was asking. Will there be less parking for residential than there was before? Because it was all residential before. Right. Um, Your Worship, so if you, if you look on page 23, uh, the chart at the top, I think it best explains it. So it, you're quite right that the parking stalls on the property won't be, won't be um, marked commercial residential. It'll be a blended parking lot. So assuming that all of the commercial parking stalls are accounted for, what happens to uh, the parking ratio per, per unit under the original pro proposal, it was 1.16 stalls per unit. Under the revised proposal, it will drop to 1.07 stalls per unit. Yeah, it's and the, Your Worship, may I clarify? Still doesn't make sense. Go ahead. Just to offer a bit of clarification, there, the commercial units were not added. They were they were a part of the original permit as well. Then where am I seeing that um, we're adding commercial to it? Huh? Okay. That would have helped me right from the beginning. Now I get it. Thank you. Welcome. See the commercial space. Thank you. Of course, the other thing, the other thing is that uh, yeah. that originally these buildings were to be for, uh, condominiums for sale, and they are now a rental building. And if I read the report sense. correctly, the required number of vehicles, or the, pardon me, the the potential uh, ownership of vehicles in a rental building is less than a strata condominium building. Correct, yeah, that's one, one aspect of the rationale for sure. Okay, thank you. Councillor Be uh, Councilor Beswick. Thank you. Um, I note that uh, the one parking stall for a commercial is still out of the equation or removed. It, given that there's commercial, is there uh, consideration for deliveries or load ins and load outs uh, given that there will be commercial operations? The, uh, there was a loading zone on the original application. However, that was an oversight, we were told. 
um, by staff, it's not allowable on that road. So the loading, the, the loading ramp was removed. However, the commercial parking was made up at the front of the building. So the first stalls in are labeled specifically as commercial parking stalls, which could be used for loading or visitors depending on, on the day. So you, on your private property, on a commercially inhabited venue, you're not allowed to have a loading zone as per a loading bay as per our city rules? You have to have it on the road? I can't answer that. Uh, no, Mr. Sorry, Your Worship, through to Councillor Bassway to clarify. So you cannot have a designated loading space on public on the public right of way. Our bylaw does require loading spaces under our current bylaw does require loading space on the property. In this case, they're asking for a variance. And in staff's experience, is our, our bylaw and our loading bylaw requirements, our loading space requirements, uh, make these assumptions that there's going to be massive uh, delivery vehicles to these properties. And what we find is that especially on properties where we have smaller commercial retail units, the deliveries are largely done by a cube van at maximum and they're done at off peak hours. And very rarely do we see um, the need for a large, large loading base in this scale of a property. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure what size the loading bay was, but nonetheless, question number two, um, recognizing that your, I think you mentioned your architect is trying to get better floor area ratio and maximum usage of the space, et cetera, and move from penthouses to four additional units from uh, from penthouse units. Uh, my question is, have is there anywhere in the design that addresses uh, fully accessible units for wheelchair accessible livability? Um, most of our, excuse me, um, all of our buildings are accessible by gr on ground. Uh, for the elevation changes are very slight, so that they are wheelchair accessible onto um, <laughs> the units on the ground floor. Uh, we have larger corridors, and we have also designed bathrooms that are larger than most. Um, so they are not uh, wheelchair, I mean, handicap uh, accessible, but they're adaptable. Thank you. It partially answers my question. I visited a couple of units that claim to be just the very thing that you said and are extremely challenging for uh, wheelchair found residents to uh, maneuver, to enter, to exit, to get to uh, social places inside the building um, without access to elevators or stairs or ramp obviously ramps and various things. So I'm hopeful in our, in 2017, that we are sensitive in our building schemes to be thoughtful about making the more, more than one unit fully wheelchair accessible livable thank you councilor yoakum um thank you i just want to comment gentlemen that um i like the project i like what's doing in the area if you can accommodate the um um, disability units that'd be great with some modifications but nevertheless I just wanted to comment quickly that I um, I like the project and uh, like you're investing in our city and also uh, in creating uh, local jobs in our uh, city so I just wanted to mention that to you guys thank you Councilor Brennan thank you your worship um, I just have a question for you about um, our policies and the transportation policy and did did you have a look at our, the uh, policies we have around parking? Yes? Yes, we, we reviewed the parking bylaw thoroughly. Right, so um, I think that, that when I listen to your proposal and I compare it with the um, transportation policy, it actually fits really well. And um, so I wanted to, to know or to confirm that when you decide you're going to invest in a city, you look at our policies and they help you make decisions about how you're going to build and where you're going to build and what it'll be like. So um, 
good on the, the parking. I like it. Thank you. Thank you. We have no further questions for you, gentlemen. Can I have a motion to receive the delegation, please? Moved by Councillor Bestwick, seconded by Councillor Hong. Thank you, gentlemen. So, there are recommendations on... Oh, pardon me. <laughs> Thank you. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. There are recommendations on page 21. Councillor Hong, moving them. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Brennan. Thank you. Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Next one. Development per, uh, variance permit number DVP 295 at 2099 Lark Crescent. Well, first off, we have to it, we have to request that uh, council hear anyone wishing to speak with respect to DVP 295 at 2099 Lark Crescent. Come forward, please. For the second time, anyone wishing to speak to 2099 Lark Crescent? And for the third and final time, anyone wishing to speak to 2099 Lark Crescent? Seeing none, Councillor Hong. Move the recommendation on page 41. Thank you. It's been seconded by Councillor Brennan. Discussion. Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Next item. Official Community Plan Amendment Application Number OCP66 and Rezoning Application Number RA288 at 2560 Bowen Road, 1900 Labio Road, and 2200 Labio Road. The purpose is to present Council with the applications to amend the official community plan designation from light uh, industrial to corridor and to rezone these properties from high tech industrial to known as I3 to community corridor core 3 including the site specific use of a portion of the property to permit automobile sales service and rental in order to facilitate the commercial and residential development Council Brennan I would move the staff recommendation that Council receive the report re pertaining to the City of Nanaimo official Community Plan Amendment Bylaw 6500.032 and Zoning Amendment Bylaw 2016 number 4500.102 and direct staff to secure a covenant for access agreements, road works, use restrictions, bicycle parking, road dedication and the community contribution prior to the adopting of the bylaw should Council support the bylaw at third reading. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Councillor Hong, thank you. Moved and seconded by Councillor Hong. Uh, discussion? Councillor Hong? Thank you. Um, these are one of those properties that could go great or I have a concern about. We sold this property at a good value. I'm, I'm hoping it's going to get developed. We're going to rezone it. But my question and concern I've always expressed is when we do rezone it, what's to prevent them not building it and flipping it, selling it as a potential development? You know, that's always been a concern for me. I would like to see these go forward and I would like to see this stuff built, but I think we've had the issue that people have rezoned, said that they can, they're going to put apartment buildings or mixed residential up and it's sat empty there for years and years and years. You know, a question to staff is, is what can we do if anything, you know, I don't know what our bylaws could be that we can say that, hey, we're going to give you two years to apply for something. If you don't, we're going to throw you in the back of the queue or I, I don't know what we can do. But how do we encourage people that are rezoning this stuff to build it? I, I think if everybody rezoned it and then built what they said that they were going to build, Nanaimo would, have been a, would be a great place right now with the amount of development that we have. So how do we encourage developers to build us on something, especially when we sold it to them as a city-owned property in hopes that they do do something instead of keeping it for, for ourselves when somebody does come forward with a plan to build something. Thank you. Uh, Your Worship, certainly if the, in the future, if the city is selling property, um, they can put a condition on the sale that there's a buyback option if there's no development in a certain period of time. But I think council knows that that brings with it its own uh, set of challenges. 
Uh, it's difficult to bring a bylaw in place. I'm not even sure if it would be lawful. I think this, that's probably a bigger issue that we'd have to get back to you on in terms of essentially rezoning the property or downzoning the property at, at a point in the future. I think really the, um, where council needs to, or what council probably needs to consider is, is the land use that's being proposed, does it comply with the vision for the community? Does it comply with the OCP? Does it bring us closer to those overall objectives? And recognize that there's some developments that will move forward quicker than others, and that is a really more of a fact of uh, the, the economics of the day. Yeah, I think my concern is just them rezoning it and then putting it up for sale. That is my concern. Been going on forever. When the arms made it. Thank you. Councillor Fuller. I totally agree with Councillor Hong, and I wouldn't just limit this to city-owned properties <laughs> because you, you go down to the south end, there's properties that have been sitting there that have been for sale that have come before Council to be rezoned and with variances put on them. As a matter of fact, I think uh, two back from us was actually flipped, if you think of it. That was one that was actually flipped that someone did buy. So to me, I was actually quite amazed that someone actually did that right away, which is great because it shows that area is really moving forward. But then when it comes to the south end, these properties just sit there for, I've seen some sit there for decades. And you know, I, I really think something needs to be done about it anyway. Thank you. Councillor Bestrick. Thank you. I'll be supporting the recommendations. Um, on page 63, Mr. Lindsay, the transportation impact. Uh, there's mention made of uh, what the city of Nanaimo should consider doing the last two bullet points on page 63. And um, to Councillor Hong's point about uh, encouraging uh, developers to do what we think that they're going to do and hope that they do and they're intending to do. My experience here has been that oftentimes we may do a considerable amount of infrastructure work prior to a development actually taking place to demonstrate our willingness to create confidence in the developer or the development. Is it reasonable for me to assume that we would not be required or do any infrastructure work until such time as we knew factually that a project was going to take place. And that, uh, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions, of the two bullet points on page, the last two bullet points on page 63. That the city would be li most likely undertaking. So, sorry, Your Worship, I think this is one of those questions where the simple answer is no. It's all up to the developer to do the to do the works, and specifically in this case, um, the developers through the rezoning will be secured the requirement to upgrade Kenworth at the time they redevelop, including intersection improvements at Kenworth and Bowen and at Labio and Kenworth. The reason I'd say that the easy answer is no is because I put a caveat on that is through, if you remember, through the land sale, we did secure road right of way that would, that would connect Labio out to Rock City. So following on Councillor Hong's um, question, and if there was a point in time and the property did not proceed and the construction of Kenworth didn't occur, but where, but where the city wanted to act on and make that connection through to the Island Highway and the intersection of the Island Highway in Rock City, at that time it would be at our cost, but it's not currently in your in your five-year capital plan to do that. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that response. Uh, we've had other major infrastructure items that have not been on our five-year plans, and I could cite examples. Port Drive, Civic Arena, former. And so I, and I'll just leave it at that. And those were million, combined millions of dollars of 
beneath ground work. And I just wish for us not to put ourselves in a position, whether it's in our five-year plan or not, that, uh, that we do prior to a development developer fulfilling their obligations, because there's, there's grade changes, there's a railway track, there's all kinds of things that will um, increase the cost to gain access to Rock City or the highway or otherwise. So I just want to make sure that we are paying close attention to that. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further speakers, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Your Worship, may I recommend, um, we didn't put in the break uh, for the council, but perhaps a 10-minute break. You've been going for four plus hours. We're just getting rolling. <laughs> You're okay. Council, what's council's wishes? No, keep going. Worship, it was accounted for on the addendum, but I forgot to go over that with you, so it was on the top of the agenda that we were supposed to have one. At nine. Uh, council, what's your pleasure? Break, keep going. Oh. Keep going. Good for you. <laughs> Next one. Bylaw. Motion the council uh, that, uh, that the official community plan amendment bylaw 2016, number 6500.032, to amend the designations of 2560 Bowen Road and parts of 2020 Labio Road, that's 1900 and 2200 Labio Road, passed first, passed first reading. We have a move. Moved by Councillor Beswick, seconded by Councillor Yoakum. Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Motion that official community plan amendment bylaw 2016, number 6500.032, pass second reading. Moved by Councillor Beswick, seconded by Councillor Yoakum again. Thank you. Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Motion that zoning amend, amendment bylaw 2016 number 4500.102, that's R8288, to rezone 2560 Bowen Road, that's 1900 and 2200 Labio Road from high tech industrial I3 to community corridor CCR3, past first reading. Councillor Hong, and seconded by Councillor Yoakum. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Call the question, all those in favor. Opposed? Motion carries. And that zoning amendment bylaw 2016, number 4500.102, pass second reading. Councillor Hong, Councillor Yoakum. Thank you. Call the question, all those in favor. Opposed? Motion carries. Next item. Bylaw contravention notice. Construction started without a building permit at 1981B Wilfert Road. Is that it's requested that council hear anyone wishing to speak with respect to bylaw contravention for 1981 Wilfrid Road? For the second time, anyone wishing to speak to 1981 Wilfrid Road? And for the third and final time? Seeing none, staff recommendation on page 68. Councillor Bestwick's moving staff's recommendation, and Councillor Hong will be seconding it. Thank you. Discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Next item. Bylaw contravention notice. Construction started without a building permit at 773 Hunter Street. It's requested that council hear anyone wishing to speak with respect to the bylaw contravention notice at 773 Hunter Street. Anyone wishing to speak to that? 773 Hunter Street for the second time. And for the third and final time. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Bestwick to the staff re staff's recommendation and seconded by Councillor Hong. Thank you. Call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Next one. Bylaw contravention notice. Construction started without a building permit at 6144 Summerside Place. Respected, it's requested that council hear anyone wishing to speak with respect to the bylaw contravention notice for 6144 Summerside Place. 
Anyone for 6144 Summerside Place for a second time? And for a third and final time, anyone for 6144 Summerside Place? Seeing none. Move council recommendation on page 72. Councilor Bestwick, seconded by Councilor Hong. Thank you. Seeing no discussion, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Next one. Secondary suite. It's requested the council. Uh, this next one is on 6631 Groveland Drive. It's requested that council hear anyone wishing to speak with respect to the bylaw contravention notice at 6631 Groveland Drive. For the second time, anyone wishing to speak to 6631 Groveland Drive? And for the third and final time, seeing none, can we have a mover for the recommendation, please? Councillor Hong and seconded by Councillor Yoakum. Thank you. Can't call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Next one. Unauthorized suite at 2310 and 2312 Tower View Crescent. It's requested that Council hear anyone wishing to speak with respect to the unauthorized suite at 2310 and 2312 Tower View Crescent. Please come on down, sir, and name and address for the record, if you would, please. Thank you. Um, Jeff Solomon, 655 6th Street. And uh, thank you very much. I know it's a, a long agenda tonight. Um, I uh, did send a letter uh, or a little note uh, this morning, and I'm wondering if um, I have a few extra copies, if anybody hasn't, if doesn't have it or hasn't read it. <laughs> um, you, you don't have one? Um, so this issue has been percolating for quite a while. It's, a, it's a, an issue that percolates throughout the entire city, um, as well as um, uh, it's, it's been it's been very a really interesting process. I, I understand very well that each municipality struggles with this kind of issue in terms of um, the secondary suites, and each municipality is. Uh, um, has to come up with policy that they can live with, that they feel is appropriate. Um, and uh, I don't have much to add, um, really. Um, the, we have a duplex. Uh, it has secondary suites. They've been there for many, many years. And um, we, um, uh, they, they afford a, a reasonable accommodation for a, a, number, of, a number of people, four different, four different families. Um, the issues that continually uh, come up in terms of why they need to go uh, is usually goes back to um, life safety. Life safety is um, a couple of words that are used on a regular basis, and it's a driver for um, um, these kind of uh, situations. Um, I, but there's a lot of variance in terms of what constitutes life safety. It, it's in terms of getting rid of secondary suites. The impact, it's important to know, to know that it, there's families living in every unit that you um, deal with. Um, and, it's, uh, and it does Im impact them because it's very difficult sometimes to find affordable housing. And so um, as, we, as, as the city grows, and uh, a reasonable accommodation will always come into um, part of the community plan and what, what the city can afford, what, what we can do in terms of uh, ensuring that people have a place to live. So um, this is one part of, of a reasonable housing plan. And um, I, uh, I must say, and I, I did point it out in the, in the letter, since we started this process um, quite a few months ago, there has been some movement in terms of um, getting rid of the suites and uh, um, before you had to get rid of the entire kitchen wiring plumbing everything it had to be that it, it would look like it never existed um, so but there has been some movement and I and I really must I must thank and commend the staff that they've looked at different options in terms of having a secondary kitchen um, because it was an unfair kind of advantage um, people that had houses 
um, often had other kitchen areas in, the, in their basement or, or some type of cooking facility or whatever, and that was not an issue. But people that had secondary suites, they were told to get rid of them because there was always that lingering fear that perhaps they might just simply plug everything back in and have everything up and running. That's, that is a step in the right direction. I think it's a good one. Um, but it doesn't, um, it does take away, if you, um, if you take away the option of, of separating units, um, then it does eliminate one type of housing. And there are many, many units that are being eliminated. And that's, and that's unfortunate um, throughout the city. So when it comes to this situation, uh, the, the policy, you need to have a policy that you can live with. It is to be reviewed. Whether or not um, you're, you're very, very comfortable with what's going on right now in terms of the enforcement and the, you know, there's a lot of staff work involved in this. My situation just on its own, I don't know how many hours have been spent in terms of reports just on a couple of suites that have been there for a couple of decades. Um, and a council meetings, I've been here a couple of times to talk about it. So it's very, very time consuming. And it, it's an important issue, but it needs to be develop a policy that you can live with. If you're happy with what you've got now, then our suites and many, many others do not meet the criteria for keeping them, and they have to go. Um, and I put it in the letter. If, if that's the case, then so be it. Um, and I would, I would hope and expect that you'll be giving lots and lots of ample time for people to make an alternate uh, accommodation. I, but my, prior, my primary th goal would be that you develop a policy first, and then you act on it, and you don't get rid of units that really do aff uh, afford um, housing for people. So that's pretty much it. Thank you for the time. Thank you, sir. I see a couple of um, questions. Sure. Councillor uh, Brennan was first. Um, what are the life safety issues that have been identified? That have been identified? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I, I, I don't know what the life safety issues are really because I, as far as I'm concerned, there, there isn't any. Um, it's, it's actually pretty safe accommodation. Um, what does the order from the city say are the life safety issues that need to be attended to? Well, uh, they want carbon monoxide. I mean, I, I gave you the list the last time. In the, in the, in Is my, this the in, same no, not, no, not, not this letter, but the, the previous one, I, I, there was about 15 different things that could be done in terms of separate different wall systems and... and uh, um, you, you know, there, there's some basic, there, there's extreme life safety issues and there's some basic safety issues in terms of, uh, th that need, that are there. And I mean, uh, it, it depends on what you're looking for. If, if you're going into a house and you have, you have, you know, you've got, um, uh, you've got an escape doors, you've got escape windows, you've got smoke alarms. Um, you've got uh, firewall protection. Those are the basic life safety issues that are usually addressed and really need to be addressed. Um, we don't have an issue with the double, uh, sometimes it's the one heating, you know, forced air and heating and it comes up and it, we don't have, it's all separated, the wiring's all separated. The, you know, I, I mean, they were saying things like you have to do the plumbing over, those aren't life safety issues. It's, it's, it doesn't have anything to do with anything. But but those become part of the criteria for keeping a suite. I mean, our suite is, is just because it's in a duplex doesn't mean it's a life safety issue. And just because it's, it has better square or more square footage than it's in the criteria doesn't mean it's a life safety issue. But, you're not, but that's not allowed under, under the certain, under the uh, protocols right now. So the second issue that's been identified is that this is a duplex that's right. and suites are not permitted in a duplex unless you um, yeah, apply for rezoning and you sound like you're reluctant to do that. It, it's, it's, I mean, we talk, uh, talked about it, we thought about it, we talked with staff about it. Um, it it's, it's, not, it's not really feasible um, under the circumstances. And, and I think I told you before is that uh, since they brought in pot the possibility of having uh, secondary suites and duplexes, and that was a couple of years ago, and 
council voted for it, there hasn't been any that have actually um, gone forward. So <coughs> it, it's not just me coming and saying it's, it's not a really a doable thing. It's, it's just that if you really add it up, it just doesn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's, you look at the cost benefit for doing anything and it's not even possible. I mean, you know, so it's not gonna happen to make it into a fourplex. Remember every house now, every new house is allowed a suite, basically. Um, so that's, to me, that's like a duplex. You have, every, every house is like a duplex. It's got two units. Different sizes and there's other. We're, all, we're sitting on half an acre here, you know. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a huge property um, and uh, it's been there for decades. So I, I think we're, we're council, I mean, I'm not, you'll have to come up with your own policy eventually. But th there's two things that when, when we look at the city coming in and it's, it's, like, it's, it's really serious life safety issues that need to be addressed because that, 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 that has to be and that's part of the municipality's responsibility. And the other ones are the nuisance properties that you're knocking on the door all the time because they just become a real hellhole for the neighborhood. This isn't either, but it doesn't meet any of the criteria. And that's, that's totally understandable. So the um, last question that I have for you is, is, I'm not sure, but is this the same property that you appeared uh, before us about a couple of months ago? Yes, that's correct. This yes. is the same one? Absolutely. Yes. Okay, we, thank you. We only have the one rental property. I mean, the, it's, a, it's a stratified uh, duplex. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Have you talked to the neighbors in, um, is it a cul-de-sac? Yeah, Tower View's cul-de-sac. We have great neighbors. I, I mean, the walls, you know, one of the big um, uh, building companies, I mean, they're, they're our next door neighbor. I was talking yesterday about making sure he eventually cuts the bush right there because I said, you know, it's growing like hell. So, uh, you know, I mean, we have, we have really good neighbors. So you have a good relationship with them, but you still believe that they would be reluctant to... Um, to have a, a duplex with suites in it beside them? It, it, you know, it, 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 first of all, the cost to, to actually make it in, it, it wouldn't, its cost benefit wouldn't, wouldn't work anyway. And, and, and really, you know, it would be, to do that, it would be making it <laughs> what it's been for the last 20 years. Uh, you, know, it, 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 you know, you would just want things to make some sense, right? And, and that's for not just this property, but policy throughout. And, and what are the priorities for, for the city in terms of, um, of what we need to provide for, for our um, for, for, for people? I, I, and, you know, you, I know, uh, Councillor Bannon, that you mentioned the life safety. I mean, one of the reasons we bought this place was to provide our daughters a place to live as they, as they moved out of the home. And, I, and I, I, they couldn't find a safe, a reasonably cost uh, residence. And so this gave them a start in terms of actually having a place to live that I didn't feel that they were, I was going to be worried about them. So it, you know, it really varies. I mean, if you're living at King Arthur Court, you probably don't feel all that safe, you know, even though it meets all the criteria for, for you know. Um, Last question. You've asked for additional time to allow the, I mean, if, if we moved ahead on this, to allow the tenants um, adequate time to find alternate space. Have you checked the Residential Tenancy Act to find oh, that? So what's the section say when you're, when you're having to um, evict a tenant on the basis of the um, requirements well, I've, of the I've, municipality? I've told them, I've told them that if, if, if there was a new, um, if council uh, um, said tonight that a Section 72 was uh, required under the Residential Tenancy Act, they would have to go um, at the end of November because they have to give them a full, a full month and, and that's at the beginning of the, of the next month. So it's obviously a concern, you know, okay. for, for them. I mean, I've told them, we started talking about this um, back, well, it's going back to last, Fe to February, and I said that, you know, this is not a secure situation for you right now, so if you find something else that really works for you, then you should proceed. And, um, but you know, it isn't, <laughs> I mean, I think you know that it's not that easy to find reasonable accommodation in a decent area that's, you know, that you're, and that you can afford, so. And they all have kids and they have animals, and that's always going to be harder. So, Mr. Solomon, I do have several other questions. Uh, Councillor Brennan, are you good? Yep. Councillor Bestwick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Solomon, for returning. Um, appreciate the information that you've provided to us. Uh, Couple of questions. Are you paying additional for garbage pickup and are you separately metered for water and so on? 
No, the Section 57 was put on the, um, the residents um, uh, a, a number of months ago uh, when, we, when I first came to Council, but I, I, it, there was never uh, the suggestion that we could keep the secondary suites, so we actually have not been charged. The, the goal was to get rid of the suites, so we haven't been charged to having suites. No. It's interesting. In Burnaby, when they recognize that there's unauthorized suites, but they, uh, they have the opportunity to pay the residents do to have an unauthorized suite and they pay extra for their garbage and everything of course because there's two yeah. uh, people or whatever families living in in the units so in some respects you're absolutely correct that one size to me does not fit all all the time and I have a question for staff are we revisiting our policy on unauthorized suites or authorized suites and if we are when do we anticipate that being complete I think that was in Sheila Muscuri's report earlier on. It's been identified twice by Council as something that it wants to do. The next step is confirming those list of reports and then sequencing them. When do you want to see that work done? It would be a shame for me if we went through that process and determined that affordable housing, which many if not all or most and some more than others uh, here advocate for affordable housing at every opportunity, which this has been an affordable housing opportunity for two decades that you know of? Well, well they took out the building permit in, in uh, 92, and I, be I believe that it was right, right after that. No. And there's families and no, pets no, and no, everything else. So it behooves me to think that two this this policy that we have, uh, I, I get it when there's no reasonable access in and out. I get it when there's no windows in a bedroom. Uh, there's all kinds of things that would make me go, oh my gosh, that doesn't really make, that doesn't sound good, doesn't, to the mind. Of all of the writings and all of the exchanges of information that I've read, uh, it sounds as though that this one kind of has a kind of life safety issue, but it kind of doesn't, um, which I think practically every dwelling in Nanaimo has a life safety issue of some description. Probably. Um, so I'm really challenged if we're going to work on the authorized, unauthorized suite policy and if this has been in existence for at least 20 years and it is does have families in it that c c clearly understand the liability that they're living in totally it just seems too easy for us to say well, they should just have to relocate they should just move out just find a new place you're breaking the law it, it's such a challenging undertaking and hard for me to fathom, especially uh, the delegation mentioned a property in Nanaimo that I think we can, uh, I can assure you that is far less safe than this property that we're talking about. Councillor Fuller, you're next. This one is, is interesting in that life safety issues aside, you're not allowed to have secondary suites in a duplex. That's it. That's the primary reason for this. The life safety issues are being used, but you are not allowed with our bylaw as it exists to have secondary suites in a duplex. Unless it's rezoned, according to that. Exactly. Um, I've been to the place, smoke detectors, windows I could climb out of, um, even if I hadn't lost 30 pounds. The, the, the life safety stuff does not seem that bad in this, uh, in this place, but it's a duplex with secondary suites. We are revisiting the secondary suite bylaw. 
my bad for not getting motion done over the last couple of weeks that I've wanted to get onto. I just have not had time to reframe it. Councillor Bestwick mentioned Burnaby. Well, one of the things with Burnaby is Burnaby doesn't actively seek out secondary suites. They don't. They rely on complaints. It's a complaint-based process. If someone complains, then they would go in and look at that. We don't. We seem to want to search them out and get people to fix them up to what we perceive as life safety. Uh, Kelowna, I believe, does the same thing with with uh, with it. Sandwich, I believe, does the same thing. So these are things we have to look at when we do the bylaw. We also have to look at grandfathering some of these things like uh, duplexes or even looking at allowing them in duplexes. What I want to see and what I'm hoping to get to is a motion that is going to stop Section 72s and Section 73s unless there's the seriousness of the life safety issues. If there isn't that second access, if there isn't, uh, you know, if there's smoke detectors are sitting there but they don't have batteries, you know, until we get everything done, I want the immediate safety dealt with that people can get out two ways. I want smoke detectors in there. The rest of it, I think, can come as we develop the bylaw. I don't think... I really need to get together with uh, Mr. Lindsay and work on this motion that I want to put forward. And part of that would be to not follow through with something like a Section 72 and 73 on, on your particular thing until we do develop and revisit the secondary suite bylaw. Get it going. Vacancy rates are dropping in this town. To find a, a reasonably priced single bedroom apartment, one bedroom or two bedroom, is almost impossible for people nowadays. So we're, we're gradually creeping down to where we were before when we had a 0 0.01 vacancy rate. It's, it's dropping. So, Councillor Fuller, yeah. so, sorry, I, yeah. I know this is an important discussion, but I think it's a larger discussion that we need to have. I and agree. there are other questions totally of the delegation. Uh, well, what I'm proposing is that, um, you know, I, I do not want to move forward with this one. So if there's a way I could frame a motion that we could hold off on this one in particular until this policy is developed, I would like to make that motion. But I just, I can't wrap my head around it. Can we hear other speakers yep. while you think about that? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Yoakum, you are next. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Sullivan, for um, presenting again on this issue. Um, fully understand that um, did, I, did I say Fuller? No, Mr. Sullivan. That's okay. <laughs> no, okay. Gord was just speaking. It's okay. Anyways, on this issue is um, obviously policies, policies are in place for safety and uh, for the, some units are just absolutely absurd. But in this case, since 92, it's been running as it is. So I think we do got to look at the policies and grandfather something that can that tackle the safety issues. It doesn't sound like there are any safety issues here. These policies aren't to be, um, we can't be using them to be punitive. And sometimes I think uh, we come with a punitive approach and I don't want to be, uh, mean-spirited government. We have enough of that in our other worlds. So, um, and most of all, what Councillor Besser said, not displace these families to find reasonable tenants or rates. So um, I'm definitely going to be in support of what Gord is leaning towards, of uh, somehow working around this. And one, I know this is, Gord, one of the options is, and number two, the council right alternative direction. We can come alternative direction to uh, um, time out things until we work on this policy. But nonetheless, to back to the delegate, I thank you. And uh, I look forward to uh, being in support. We can think, be creative, think out of the box, and not just be stuck in this cookie cutter approach. Because to me, all these housing issues are like our old line of work, case by case. Yeah. And this is a case by case scenario. As, um, so I just want to share that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Brennan. Thank you. Um, I have heard that um, I've heard Mr. Solomon's description about the life safety issues at the at the building. But I'd like to hear from staff. What are the 
Are there any compelling? Do you think I should um, receive the delegation? Okay. I'll we, move that we receive we, the delegation. We do have uh, one other question, Councillor Hong. No, I'll wait. All right, All right, thank you. So that being the case, I see no other questions. Motion to receive the delegation. So moved. Councillor Brennan, seconded. Councillor Kipp, thank you. Thank All you. in favour? Opposed? Carried. Thank you, sir. What does the staff see as the significant life safety issues? Um, maybe your worship, sorry, Mr. Chairman, uh, maybe to start with, I'd, I'd just like to give us a little bit of background and then maybe in more general and then get into the specifics of, of this property because I think it's relevant. And, and of course, the majority of council will know in 2005, we legalized suites in all single family homes throughout the community. This issue of um, suites or ancillary units, whatever you want to call them, in duplexes um, is something that the council has struggled with since that time. And as recently as 2013, council put a moratorium on enforcement until such time that there was a review. There was a review that was done at that time. It was run through the Development Process Review Committee, uh, ultimately came to forward to council, and it resulted in, in the case where we have suites and they're known to have existed prior to um, January 1st, 2013, where we have suites and duplexes, they can come forward and address the life safety issues like any other suite in the community, but they must apply for rezoning because as of now, they're not a permitted use on that property. So there's really two, two, um, two lines to pursue, the rezoning and the, the, um, and the life safety issues. In case of this specific application, the building department staff have worked with um, the property owner to identify those life safety issues. I don't have them in detail, but I understand that in their opinion, they're not um, substantial items. There are items such as, uh, I believe there's battery powered smoke detectors in the units now where the actual code requires hardwired interconnected smoke detectors between the units. So that's something we'd, we'd obviously want to pursue whenever we look at life safety issues, we like to pursue that. Uh, the other um, issue is separation, making sure there's, there's adequate separation between units. If the building was originally built with the whole idea that it was simply a duplex, there wouldn't be, normally be separation between the upper and, and lower units. Um, so my question then becomes, um, I don't have any um, burning interest in moving people out of their homes either. Um, and I remember um, when we first looked at the question of secondary suites, we did put into abeyance all enforcement. You, you were around for that time. Is my memory correct on that, uh, that we put into abeyance? Uh, prior to 2005? Yeah. That's correct, yes. Yeah, okay. So we did that. Um, I know that there would be a motion that, um, that we could put together on that. I think we, we've kind of we made a decision at that time, no to set secondary suites in, in um, duplexes. And then I see we've done it again in 2013, sort of confirmed that by saying you have to just get the rezoning. And I think perhaps the time now is to look at it and see if we can't just treat them like secondary suites. I am concerned that those minor um, issues like hardwired um, smoke alarms be put in that, that we make sure that uh, Mr. Solomon does those more minor ones. Um, and then I would um, look to staff to assist us with a, uh, drafting a motion um, that puts uh, enforcement into abeyance until such time as a a report uh, is brought back to council with recommendations. Um, okay, I do have another speaker unless you have anything to comment on at this point, Mr. Lindsay. Councillor Fuller. And that's exactly uh, what Councillor Brennan is talking about is what I've been trying to work on with uh, Mr. Lindsay in pulling together some of the other uh, community policies, etc., and recognizing that affordable housing strategy is on our agenda. Secondary suites are part of an affordable housing strategy. 
uh, minimum standard of maintenance bylaw would be a part of our affordable housing strategy. A minimum standard maintenance might actually uh, help with that as well. Uh, looking at density bonusing, all of the aspects on affordable housing would be involved in this. So, I don't want to fly off the seat of my pants on this. I do want to get together and discuss this. So, so un until we get this motion put forward, it, it's been done before. We've had a moratorium. So there's no reason we can't have another moratorium. And if, if the motion would simply be that a moratorium uh, on Section 7273 is, is put in place until a thorough review of secondary suite policy in conjunction with the affordable housing policy has been completed, recognizing that um, substantial life safety issues like and, and see now I'm making it too complicated which I tend to do <laughs> uh, I would like to see the hardwired the interconnected smoke, smoke inter, interconnected smoke alarms put in but I think that could be added into the future uh, just having a mor moratorium on section 72s and 73s until we do a thorough review of the secondary sweep policy would be can would I be ask the easiest motion to make. Sorry, Councillor Fuller. Can I ask Ms. Samra for yeah, her unless, comment on this? Hang on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Unless extreme safety issues are recognized. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah. So I, I think we might have something here. Yeah. Review unless, huh? Okay. I, I would. Ms. Samra, please. Thank you. I'd like to defer a decision on this agenda item till next week. That'll give staff an opportunity to sit down and take a look at some of the issues that we need to take a look at. Uh, an opportunity to talk about the type of work that Mr. Solomon can undertake uh, to address some issues. So, rather than uh, doing it right now, we'll make sure that we uh, put some work in between now and next week. Thank you. So I would be, in that case, looking for a motion to, a motion to defer. defer. A motion to defer the issue till um, next week. Next regular council meeting. When when can you get that, Dale? Next council. It's a holiday. The, yeah, there's no meeting on Monday. Um, okay, so next council meeting then. Yes, it's October easy. 17th. That gives two weeks. Yeah. Motion to defer to the next council meeting. Is there a seconder for that motion to defer? Councillor Kipp, thank you. Any discussion on the motion to defer? Yeah, all we're doing, all we're doing is deferring it for two weeks. That's all we're doing. Um, I would like to, uh, to try and get together and get a motion made that we can bring forward, not just, uh, you know, uh, trying to figure everything out in two weeks. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I think staff's understanding of that motion would basically be on this specific file to bring it back in two weeks and giving us that time for us to flesh out the motion, A that, broader could be, that, motion. that could be brought forward and, and then allow this project to be considered within the context of that proposed motion. Sounds good. I'll make the time. I'll, somehow I'll find the time to get together with you because my working hours are the same as your working hours, which can be really complicated when you're dealing with crises, but I will make that time. Any other speakers on the motion to defer? Sorry, I, yeah, I cleared the queue. Councillor Bestwick. Sorry, Councillor Hong, did you want to speak to the deferral? Councillor Bestwick can go first. He hasn't spoken. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just curious as to whether this is for 2310 and 2312 Tower Crescent or if this also includes 3464 Blackfoot Way. So it's, so it's off. Oh, thank you. My apologies. I've got 47 green sheets and an addendum green sheet. And, and my next comment question would be, um, Will we then not bring forward any other 
similar unauthorized suite infractions um, during this blackout period. So we won't bring any forward for the next meeting, if there is any. If there's any scheduled, um, Mr. Chairman, we'll make sure that they're, they're not on the agenda. And then pending the outcome of, of Council's discussion two weeks from now, that'll, that'll set us on a course of how we proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hong. Um, thank you. This is a zoning issue for me, bottom line, zoning issue. I, I don't want to talk about life safety. The biggest problem we have here is duplexes with suites that's not zoned. It's like me getting a corner lot, having a carriage house, having a suite in my house, having a suite in my carriage house, turning my garage, my accessory, accessory building into another suite and a corner lot. Essentially, that's a zoning issue. This is a zoning issue. Even though I have all these safety issues, if I can say that, hey, I have all that meet the safety requirements, it's a corner lot, yeah, it's an accessory building, but I've turned my basement into another suite, and I've turned my accessory building into another suite, and there's one above it. So now I have a fourplex, four units, on one residential zoning. This is strictly zoning. And, and I understand Councillor Fuller's issue, but I don't think we're going to solve this in two weeks. This is still going to be an issue. I don't think we're going to have an answer. I'm not going to pause anything because if we pause it, well, the first thing I'm going to tell all my developer friends is go buy up all those duplexes. It's going to turn into a fourplex because we're talking about that. This is a zoning issue, not life safety. I'm thinking these are two separate things. I think we do need the discussion about the life safety and the secondary suites, but this isn't a single family dwelling with a suite that needs life safety. This is a duplex with a suite zoning issue. So I wanna make sure that we're gonna separate this. We're gonna defer this for two weeks. Why? Are we gonna deal with a zoning issue in two weeks? I don't expect they'll to come up with a zoning issue and, and solve this for us in two weeks. We have other things to do. Now we've added another thing on top of the list that we wanna get done. Well, I want to get the stuff done that we're supposed to get done on the list. This is a zoning issue. So let's go down our list. And that's what I like to see. So I'm not in a motion to defer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Kipp, on the motion to defer. It's made up. As we go, every community is different, so it can be made up as you go. You can change anything you want. 1996, I wanted secondary suites brought in and not to be hunted, but they get hunted. If our garbage guy sees the extra can, six months later, we're in that place. Oh, just, I, I, I defer it because it needs to be changed, and zoning is so subjective and arbitrary. We make it up. Councillors like this make them up as we go, and we don't even know about it. Don't even know how to design a suite, let alone a building. So I, I think we need to redo how we think of what housing is and what is affordable. So I support passing this off for a few weeks. And thank you. On the deferral, Mr. Mayor? Yep. No. Nope. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you indicated. Nope. Uh, I see no other speakers then, so I will call the question on the motion to defer for two weeks. All those in favor? Opposed? Councillor Hong opposed? That motion carries. Thank you. Good job, Ian. Thank you. Just before we move on, if I could. Councillor Brennan. I just want to caution us about um, making this too broad um, a subject because um, the um, secondary suite policy is something that is a discrete policy that has um, a very specific need identified in the community. And we can do that, uh, that piece quite in quite an orderly fashion and get it done. 
um, to tack it on to the um, problem of the bigger problem of in, ensuring and building and preserving affordable housing in the city is a much bigger problem. And if we tack our secondary suites onto it, it will take a much longer time to get any policy um, together for the secondary suites. So it's just my opinion, and I'm certainly not in charge here. I just um, wanted to make that comment. As others have made other comments, so it seemed fair. Councillor Fuller. Uh, no, I, I won't uh, make a comment towards that. Um, I, you know, we have an affordable housing strategy on the books. I'm presuming it's not going to take us 10 years to accomplish that. That's one of our priorities to be accomplished within the next year or so. So I think. Thank you. Next item, advisory committee meeting uh, minutes. The July 14th uh, Design Advisory Panel and, July, and August 25th. Moved by Councillor Hong and seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Thank you. Discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Opportunities, assessment of city owned land, Greater Nanaimo Water District lands. Mr. Lindsay. Thank you, Your Worship. I wanted to take um, a couple minutes uh, and introduce this, this topic. Uh, we have a brief report in your agenda, and I've just asked maybe if the PowerPoint can be brought up on the, on the screen. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to start off with a little bit of, of, of context for you. Of course, you, your council will recall it was, it was last Monday we were here. Um, and you received a report on both the biophysical and archaeological studies that have been done for what we refer to as the Greater Nanaimo Water uh, District lands, the GNWD lands. And the motion from Council last week was to go away uh, staff and look at the opportunities and do an assessment on, on non-park and park potential of these lands. Um, so I wanted to start a little bit and just talk about the official community plan as it stands today. The heavy black line is your current uh, urban containment boundary. Uh, the parkway is, is the line that, that separates uh, the lands outside. Maybe this map's easier to talk to. The red outline here um, is the entire properties that we refer to when we talk about the GNWD lands. So the lands north of the Nanaimo Parkway, there's that small portion there. Uh, currently under the OCP, those are, are at this time designated as parks and open space. And the lands south of the parkway are a designated resource protection. And in real general terms, your OCP talks about in resource protection, the use of agriculture, environmental, and recreational land uses. I would also note that uh, as the lands are outside the urban containment boundary, um, at present, the OCP does not contemplate the extension of, of services into this area. Now, overall, the GNWD lands are about 97 hectares, so that's about 240 acres. And that has north of the parkway, that's about 13 hectares, 32 acres, south, 84 hectares, 208 acres. Uh, at present, there is limited servicing in this area. There is on the, um, on the north side of the property, I'm sorry, I don't have a laser pointer, but just uh, there's sewer, and, uh, sewer that comes to that area. It just touches on the side of the GNWD on the north boundary. There is water that goes down both uh, Harewood Mines and the Nanaimo Lakes Road on both sides and brings servicing to the subdivision that you see out on the bottom right side of the image there. But there, are, there is no real, at this time, um, sewer um, availability for, for the property. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there was, there was the work done that you saw last week, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over that, but in real simple terms, you have, the, you have here um, a plan that shows you those areas that the studies recommend that are either have limited potential for uses um, or have a, have a sensitivity either because of slope or environmental uh, sensitivity. Uh, there's also uh, some existing encumbrances on the property in terms of there's a hydro right-of-way that separates the property. There's a Fortis uh, gas lease that's uh, five acres, one hectare. 
uh, just on the bottom bottom part of your image. And there's also two sections of the property um, that have historic development. There's the Greater Nanaimo Water District office uh, building to the north near Reservoir 1, and to the south there's the Nanaimo Animal uh, Shelter. So knowing uh, those um, encumbrances that are on the property, staff set aside and did a real high level work here in terms of providing you with some numbers or some ideas about um, what would be probably park use or potential for park use given the encumbrances that are on it and what, what amount of lands are currently unencumbered. And, and I'll qualify that in a minute. So if you, if you look at those polygons in total, there's about 52 hectares, 128 acres, I'm talking about the land south of the parkway here, uh, that, that are currently in, encumbered or have some park potential. Um, but, and I would note though about 10 of those hectares, nine of, the, nine of that's in the uh, current um, lease for the hydro right of way, and there's about one hectare uh, that's in, um, as I mentioned, in the Fortis uh, lease. And that leaves us with about 32 hectares of, of unencumbered land. Now I'll say unencumbered, but all of these parcels um, have second growth forests on them. And as you can see on the, on the images in your report, um, a number of them are crisscrossed with both informal and formal trails. So in polygon number two, there's the uh, Trans Canada Trail, which, which runs relatively parallel to the road. So there's certainly some, some recreational uses existing in all of these parcels today. And your worship, unless there's any questions, that just uh, summarizes the report. Any questions? Seeing none, motion to. Mm -hmm. That's okay. How much other GNWD land is there besides this piece? Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a motion to receive the report? Yeah. Moved by Councillor Thorpe, seconded by Councillor Bestrick. All corporate officer. Ma'am. There's a delegation to speak to this report too, oh, I think. Pardon me. Um, it was a late Thank item, you. Mr. Terry Wagger, I believe. Mr. Wagger. Thank you. So uh, these lands, which we sort of call the water board lands uh, colloquially, have been on my mind for a while. Uh, as I understand it, uh, there's, uh, we have to A, first of all, consider uh, Stenaimo. These are all their lands that we're on. I'm sure you're all aware of that. But in particular, uh, apparently, uh, they used to hunt up there and camp up there and while they were hunting and... Uh, so they feel like they have some justified claim to that area. And I think we should respect that foremost. And then there's uh, also some concerns expressed by, I'm, I know that some people want to perhaps develop some of that land and so the city can make money off of it. And I, I suppose I could see why that would make sense. And if that happens, I would prefer to see it myself along the Nanaimo Lakes Road section because that seems like a logical place to do it. There's road frontage there, easy sewer access, and it would still leave all the interior part of that area for parkland, which is uh, my primary concern. I would like to see that land become part of the Colliery Dams Park. It's right adjacent to it, and it's been sort of a topic of discussion for years that one day that might become part of the park. And uh, so I would like to see a combination of those three things. Some development accommodates Nanaimo and make it a park. All three of those can be done. We can give some of the land to Nanaimo and they can develop it if they want on Nanaimo Lakes Road. The city will get development fees. Nanaimo will get money and or housing. The rest of the land, make it into a park. Those are my ideas anyway. Obviously, you guys will do whatever you decide to do. That's it. I'm done. Thank you. Move receipt. Move seconder. Second. Councillor Hong, thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Now, we've got limited time. We've got about uh, we've got 25 minutes to end off. Uh, is there a pleasure to go on to any particular item here? 
Yes. Just to. No, Your Worship, oh, I'm sorry. I'm I sorry. interrupted you. I interrupted you with the delegation reminder. So I believe it was moved and seconded, but you didn't vote on it. Okay. So we moved and, and uh, to, we moved and seconded and voted on to receive the delegation. Okay. Now we're on to the uh, on to the report itself. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Samer. Just putting a recommendation forward in the interests of time. The core services implementation um, report could wait till next week. It gives council a little bit more time to look through some of the timing um, aspects to it and to interact with staff between now and then. So if you want to move that to the next week, that might be an option. Okay. So next the, meeting. I'm sorry. Next. Next meeting. We're not next meeting, meeting on Monday. Thank you. It's a holiday, I think. So we've got those other two items. Two items. Okay, so then there's nothing left but uh, question period. Okay, come on. <laughs> there's two reports. Two uh, reports. 7D, the property maintenance for industrial okay. property, and 9B, the human trafficking. Okay, report. so 7B, B as in Bravo or Delta? 7D as in Delta. Delta. Great, thank you. Okay, back to the white sheets. 70. Property maintenance for industrial properties. C addendum, that'd be a green sheet. And it's to present as requested by council information on property maintenance enforcement options for industrially zoned properties. And that is a one page report. Mr. Davidson, do you wish to uh, present any portion of this? Your um, Worship, this, count, uh, this, this report was um, accepted at the last council meeting. Um, so um, do you want me to represent or, or were there questions from council? I'm, What's this report went forward for? at the last council meeting. Um, Councilor Yoakum. Thank you. I requested to be on the agenda. I was at the meeting when that was a couple of two Mondays ago, I believe. Um, nevertheless, um, I just like to put some consideration as we're discussing policies around the earlier conversation. I know we're not dealing with uh, the duplex and suites and whatnot, but conversation around those unsightly properties around commercial where um, they sort of go to back burner or not much attention, and we go on these quite spent quite extended amount of time on these houses of blackberries or what the gentleman earlier was up on Sherwood, I believe it was. So I just think we, we could look into that and because um, there's so many unsightly commercial industrial sites in our city and uh, just bring some awareness to it and more than awareness, but maybe do some action on it. And uh, but I think when you go over the policies, it'd be perfect timing. So I want to bring awareness and I just didn't think, I, I didn't think we were. Thank you. Thank you. So it's in our it's it's showing as a report. So I'm going to call the question to receive the report. Unless you have something further, I just would like to add that with Ms. Armstrong joining us and um, looking at the bylaw area, she's going to have an opportunity to take a look at a number of our policies and bylaws and and work with staff on addressing issues that council has has raised. Thank you. So can we have a motion to uh, to receive the report? Moved by Councillor Beswick, seconded by Councillor Yoakum. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. So, next one. 9B. 9B. The purpose is to provide information to Council regarding the City's initiatives to address the issue of human trafficking and sexual exploitation. Is anyone from staff going to address this one or are we just simply going to uh, re re receive the report? Can we have a motion to receive the report? Councillor Brennan, thank you. Seconder? Second. Councillor Thorpe, it's now on the table for discussion. Councillor Fuller. I forgot my notes on this one. Um, Unfortunately, 
there's a number of things uh, that it talks about, like they're itemized one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Uh, creation of peer based response by a community action team, which is a small group of women with lived experience in the sex trade who connect. That's one woman. It's not a small group, and she does have the lived experience. Creation of materials for young high school age females. That has been done, I believe. Uh, three, funding was acquired by a civil forfeiture funds to create an outreach worker who connects with sex trade workers and supports those who choose to leave the sex trade. That funding actually was used towards uh, creating a rent subsidy, not the, this, the person we're talking about is the person of the CAT team that goes out and talks to them, and it's the same person as one person. Uh, the creation of an exit option for women or men seeking to leave the street-based sex trade includes a rental supplement. That has been created. Uh, and the support worker was actually paid out of those civil forfeiture things. The support worker is actually the cat team person. Uh, development of a relationship with an Nanaimo-based primary care physician who is willing to work. They haven't been able to do that at this point. There is someone at uh, Brooks, not Brooks Landing, um, Port Place Mall who is willing to see the people but not work with them to any extent. So that hasn't been accomplished yet. Um, establishing a relationship with Vancouver Island, that has happened apparently. I don't know to what extent. And uh, participation in a provincial collaborative of those working on this issue and attendance at a recent form, Collaboration in Action, Best Practices in Sex Worker Services, Policy and Policing held in Vancouver and hosted by the City of Vancouver. That they, I don't believe anybody ever went to that one. They did go to another one which was based on... Uh, um, youth sex trade, but nothing to the extent of this. So for me, I'm not going to accept this report because I know I've got it from people's mouths that this report is not correct. And so I will not accept the report. Thank you. Councillor Yoakum. Thank you. I remember bringing this in the summer, I brought this to the table, and um, I'm not going to uh, critique the report, nevertheless, I just want to bring an awareness to this very important subject that's happening in our backyard and many backyards. And also, um, if we can modify, I don't know if it would be modify or um, Ms. Samra with your staff, add to the exploitation of education and the, um, sorry, I just get a little, because it hits home somewhat, is uh, the creeps that prey on kids and, um, we got to we got to reduce that somehow through awareness about when the when the police officers are just talking to us on camera once I remember talking about I guess I can't say it well I will say it about the um, online predators out there so we got to bring awareness to educate online like to add that piece somehow in this whole thing so I just want to bring awareness this has happened in our backyard and I'm not suggesting anyone's blind to it but we got to ensure the safety of these um, the women are being exploited but also the children as well. I mean, actually, in this case, anyone being sexually exploited. Just want to share those words, um, Mr. Mayor. Just bring awareness, and we gotta, you know, let's be leaders in this area of uh, eliminating and reducing. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Brennan. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I think this is a, um, this is a good report, and I think it gives us a good historical account of how. Um, we came to start doing this work in Nanaimo and our relationship with the RCMP and the initiatives of the RCMP with the um, sex trade cohort. The um, RCMP came to us in um, maybe around 2011 and said that um, Wally Opal's report on the downtown east side and the murdered and missing women there uh, was going to be coming forward, that there were going to be recommendations, and we needed to get out a, a 
ahead of that. And so we started to work on, on these initiatives. And um, it, uh, it was tagged by them as the sex trade cohort. And they have worked very hard in um, collaboration with uh, the Women's Center, with um, the uh, experiential women. Um, they have done a tremendous amount of work and they've, they've made great strides, I think, in providing services and safety to women who, uh, w women and, and men who work on the street, but it, it is primarily women who are on the street and young women. And um, so I, I take my hat off to um, the social planner for, for his report. I take my hat off to the RCMP and the other players that have been working to create um, safe places for women and um, safe uh, and available exits. And I think the report tells you they're working with the School District 68, um, um, doing education pieces with the, the children there. So. Um, yeah, is it going to solve everything? No, probably not. Um, but I've met with several women from the um, community action team, and um, maybe there's just one left, but there was more than that um, who I met with. So um, <coughs> good report. Thank you. I'm sure that we will forge on and, and uh, create uh, more and better services, but I think this is um, actually quite... Uh, Quite a good report. And the report attached by Lisa Barron, Lisa Marie Barron, is an excellent report. And um, I think if, if you took the time to read it, it would be really, um, um, would just really not just compliment but support this report as, as being going in the right direction. Thank you. Councilor Bessery. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just in reading the report, uh, the three pillars, of course, that have been uh, addressed. Um, it's the fourth pillar that, uh, to me, and that's the the most well, I shouldn't say the most important, but one, a very important piece. And that's prosecution, and that falls outside the purview of and onto the RCMP's lap. And I just uh, it was about a month ago when we met with the RCMP to prioritize our priorities for their calendar year and where our focus and emphasis was to, in our backyard, to clean up our home and our streets. And uh, for me, we all recognize this is a critical and a very important topic, uh, as already been expressed. And if, if we aren't willing to pursue prosecution, if we aren't willing to make that a priority, in our own detachment and our own department beyond the education and the awareness and all those things that are great in this cohort and, and so on. From, it, it's an action item to me. And if it's as important to all of us, which I believe it is, then we have to action it. And we have to deliver a strong message to the fourth pillar, which is prosecution. And I, which means that we have to insist upon our local detachment to make it a priority. And I don't know what the, that we did. I don't know that we made it a priority, um, at least a strong enough one, to send a very strong message uh, about how we might be able to address what is going on in our own, in our own city. Uh, awareness is great. Education is great. The working together is great. The collaboration is great. OK, now let's make it a priority and prosecute. Thank you. Councillor Fuller. I wasn't saying the whole report is, and I'm going to use this word that I was uh, slammed with um, earlier tonight, crap. What I'm saying is the items that I read are not true. And if they're not true, they should not be in the report. I actually sit on the cohort. So, yeah, but I haven't seen you there. So. Um, sex trade cohort has not existed since 2001. Yeah. We've got less than no. 10 minutes. So want, anyway, I along. sit on the cohort. If I see stuff that isn't correct in a report, I want it taken out. 
The rest of it I totally agree with. We have actually, the sex trade cohort is actually a model that is being looked at in other communities. And it's great. But when there's incorrect information in there, I don't want that being put out as fact. That's all I'm saying. If it's incorrect, it needs to be looked at and taken out of the report. The rest of the report is great. Don't have a problem with that. That's fantastic. I work with the women. I work with the homeless every day. So. Thank you. Samra. Thank you, Your Worship. So um, we're at a different place uh, with the organizational structure of the city, and Mr. Horn now works with the culture, heritage, and social area in Mr. Lindsay's shop, and Bruce Anderson is the manager there. So one of the things that council can consider is maybe not tonight, or if you feel like it tonight, a direction for staff to, to continue to work in this area. And this is something that would benefit from going in front of two separate committees to support the policy framework and action items, um, both the Culture, Heritage, and Social Committee, as well as the Public Safety Committee. So this is an opportunity for council to um, confirm that this is a priority that you want worked on by staff. Staff now has two different committees that it can go to for different aspects of it because it's there's prevention, there's enforcement, there's a whole range of things that need to be done. And now we have a good uh, group that's uh, got that critical mass that can start doing this type of policy work and come away, come back to council at a future date with some ideas. So we don't necessarily need a motion, but letting you know that you've got committees and staff that are able to keep, continue to move this forward. And we'll take a look at it to verify that the facts within it are correct. If there are any errors, um, we'll undertake to correct those in the online posting. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add that, uh, that while we have, uh, while there's four pillars listed, uh, the fourth one's not funded by anybody but ourselves. So, uh, you know, when the Government of Canada produces a bill called C-36 and uh, we don't uh, see any accompanying funding to deal with, uh, with uh, apprehension and charges and support from Crown Council, uh, we've, got the other things to, we've got the other issues to worry about. One of the things I am concerned about is, and I wanted to ask the question, under our uh, action plan, there were 19 separate items. Um, which looks like actions, to, which look like actions. I just wanted to know if there's anybody at the staff level that can help us with how we're doing with those 19 action plans. Are we accomplishing what we, what we wanted to with the action plan, or do we need to, uh, to consider additional resources to it? I, I think, Your Worship, I think that's a question that we'd like to answer once we've had the opportunity to go to the committees and then come back to uh, introduce more fully the, the actual action plan. and and talk to you about those those outcomes that we've had so far. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, motion to receive the report. Okay. Councillor Bestwick. It's been moved and seconded. and seconded. And all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. So, uh, on to question period. We have about six minutes. Terry Rager, 71 Caledonia Avenue. About the uh, Calgary Dam report, when are we going to get some numbers that break down and tell us what, uh, what everything cost? In particular, I'm curious about the engineering fees. My understanding is that there's a huge amount of money paid to engineers, and I would like to know why. Will that information be coming at some point? Yes, we can bring that forward. I uh, actually had a, a, rep a report, but that is uh, left with Mr. Rosen, so I'm not able to rattle those numbers off, but I'm happy to share those. Because uh, obviously I'm not an engineer, but I'm sure that we all see a big concrete box up there, and uh, I'd like to have a, a good understanding of why it costs so much to engineer it. When will the report be coming out? I'll take a look at posting it on the website and this necessarily needs to be another report coming forward unless council wants another report. We can have a summary of that information available for the public. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? 
If not, motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries.